Well, good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. I would remind everyone in the gallery to turn all electrical devices to silent so as not to interfere with the meeting. We've received apologies from committee members Jackie Bailey and Gillian Martin. And uh, item one is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, we turn to our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance. This morning we have what we call a roundtable session, so it's um, slightly less formal than we just have a panel of witnesses that we put questions to, and hopefully the uh, questions and discussion will start to flow once we get going. Um, we have uh, a number of guests <coughs> this morning, and um, perhaps I could just ask each of you to... Um, introduce yourselves, give us your name and very briefly introduce who you are, the organisation you represent uh, before we get started with some questions from committee members. Um, no need to operate the microphone system, that will be operated by the sound desk for everyone and if you want to come in in the discussion at any point simply raise your hand and I'll try and bring you in at an appropriate point. So. Um, thank you to all of our witnesses for coming in. So perhaps if you could give your name, your organisation, what the organisation does by way of introduction. And I'll, I'll start with Louise Smith and we can move around the room from that point perhaps. Sure. So my name is Louise Smith. I'm one of the Treasury FinTech envoys uh, for Scotland. And secondly, I work for the Royal Bank of Scotland, largely in the retail bank, where I'm accountable for the transformation of the retail bank, particularly digital. Hello, I'm uh, Chris van der Kyle. I am a technology entrepreneur and here today as well I, as chairman of Entrepreneurial Scotland and chairman of a number of technology companies in the games and data analytics space I, as well. Good morning, my name is Emil Stickland. Uh, I'm here from Thrive Digital, which is an e-commerce consultancy, um, but I'm also here representing a prospective uh, institute for the Institute of E-commerce, which will hopefully have the goal of uh, raising awareness and improving e-commerce across Scotland. Um, my name is uh, Pete Moforth. I'm Chief Exec of Indes. We're a long-standing e-commerce business based in Glasgow and we look after and work with a large number of uh, mostly SMEs here in Scotland uh, selling, selling products online through e-commerce. Hi, I'm Joshua Ryan Sahar. I am the skills lead at the Data Lab, which is one of the eight innovation centres, of course, sponsored by the Scottish Government. My role in particular is to help Scotland um, grow and train as many data scientists or artificial intelligence experts as, as needed. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Graham Jones. I'm the CEO of Scottish Financial Enterprise. I'm a board director of FISAB. I'm also a director of Scottish Investment Operations. Right, well, thank you very much. If I might start with a fairly general question for our guests, um, and really it's just to see what your comments are on how the Scottish economy has performed over the past 10 years, um, both generally and from the point of view of your own particular interest in your own sector in it. And uh, not just looking to the past, but also looking to the future, what do you see as the key opportunities and, and risks facing Scotland and also I think I've read in the press about small business confidence being slightly down at the minute. Do you have any comments on that? So who would like to start off? Um, Emil Strickland. So, uh, I mean, in, in terms of e-commerce, it's quite difficult to tell how good Scotland, or how well Scotland is doing uh, in relation to the rest of the UK. Uh, the UK, we know, is one of the, I mean, per capita, it is the best performer um, globally, number three in terms of total uh, e-commerce retail sales. So it's punching well above its weight uh, on an international scale. Um, anecdotal evidence suggests that this has not been replicated within Scotland. Um, but I don't have any, any, any numbers. Um, as far as I'm aware, they don't exist. But if you look at things like go Google Trends, um, which obviously Google Trends indexes 
Google search volume across the internet. And if you look at various regions in the UK, um, the term e-commerce, and, and people who are searching for e-commerce are not looking to buy things. They're looking to engage in some way with e-commerce. Um, and if you look, I mean, London obviously indexed at 100, the highest search volume there, and the, gradually you move out and out and out, and it dips, and you get to Wales, which is around 70, and then the Midlands is quite strong. There are areas in Manchester and places like that, which are very good. And Scotland, the lowest I've seen it is 30. So really the, the amount of search volume and interest in e-commerce as a subject uh, is, is very much lower than the rest of the UK. Um, so, I, I mean, another piece of kind of anecdotal evidence on this is if you look at Alibaba, which is the world's largest uh, e-commerce company, and if you look at B2B trade, so Alibaba is, they do own B2C elements in China, but the majority of it is all uh, B2B, and you can go and list your products. It's a bit like eBay for B2B. Uh, and if you look at the top uh, countries for Scottish whiskey, uh, and this is in order, you get China, Germany, Japan, Thailand, Taiwan, UAE, UAE England, United States, Hong Kong, Hungary, and then Scotland. Uh, so we're quite a long way down selling our biggest export on the world's largest B2B export market, which, although you know, it's difficult to draw any firm conclusions on that, but I would think that would stand us in in pretty bad stead as a whole uh, e-commerce uh, country. Is there any way to improve that? <laughs> yeah, to, to uh, begin to teach people and tell people about the opportunities, uh, because it's not difficult to set up. You know, the, the distilleries could be doing this direct and selling direct at a much higher margin. I mean, the, the two reasons for that is either other countries are exporting at a, a wholesale price and putting on Scottish whiskey onto <coughs> Alibaba, or it's fakes. So it, it's a kind of, it's a brand protection. If there's a demand there, there should be a supply there. Um, but also we, we're giving a big chunk of a major export to other countries because they're able, they're clearly able to sell it. There's a market for it. So, yeah. I just want to come to, sorry. Just on that very point. Um, how much of that uh, reflects the fact that much of Scotch whiskey is owned by large international companies and there is lack of headquarters function in Scotland? I mean, that, that I don't know the answer to, but um, considering that China and Germany are number one, I would think that, I mean, I would think that a lot of the Chinese ones are fakes and probably a lot of the German ones are just the Germans are good at exporting and using Alibaba. Um, I, I don't know the intricacies of the market, um, but from this kind of very simple evidence, and I understand it is simple, it would suggest that Scotland is not performing as well as it could do. Um, you, I mean, this, this is just the search volume on the first few pages. So all the small distilleries, for example, that are still owned by Scottish uh, companies and all the craft distilleries that are coming through um, on the back of the kind of gin boom, they could be listing globally and they could have access to a global market overnight. But there's no support for doing that. Um. Right, thank you. Move to Graham Jones and then Chris van der Kyl also wanted to come in. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so just in terms of answering the question, what's the last 10 years been like? I, I guess what I'd say is the, the world's changed a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, customers and customer expectations have changed a huge amount in the last 10 years, probably faster, I would say, than... In the previous, I've been working 40 years in banking financial services, and the change in the last 10 years has been faster than the previous 30. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our kind of analysis around it, the, the downturn in the oil and gas industry has a, a, an enormous impact, much more deeply than just the, the surrounds of Aberdeen. It, it affects all of those people who are involved in the supply chain, uh, whether it's hotels, whether it's... Um, uh, engineering companies based down here in Edinburgh, Glasgow, or even in North Yorkshire, uh, it's had an enormous impact. However, I think it's fair to say it's quietly the, 
the, the price of a barrel of Brent crude is quietly uh, coming back up again, which I think is good. So we're showing uh, a bit of recovery there, and, I, and no one welcomes that more than we do. In terms of how does it impact on banking and FS, it's, we, are, we are financial services. We serve the community. Uh, we serve customers at the day's end. We're very large businesses, but we sell, serve end customers. <clears throat> and one of the first things that happened when, when, when people come under a bit of economic pressure is a discretionary spend goes out the window. So people make the car do another couple of years and don't renew the car. Rather than moving to a bigger house, they might say, well, we'll build an extension on the existing house we've got. Um, they might not go on holiday. There's a whole raft of things that you do have been there myself, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's things that you have to do to tighten the belt. And, and that, of course, affects the economy enormously. Because at the moment, just now, if you look at consumer-led growth in the UK economy, the Bank of England would say it's going to be around about 2%, but it's a consumer-led economy. So if there's anything that interrupts uh, the, the ordinary customer, the ordinary man in the street, that has an impact. Um, <clears throat> we've also have a lower population growth, so combined with slightly lower productivity. We've made great inroads, by the way, in productivity in, in, uh, most lately, but that's also a contributor. Um, uh, R&D businesses were ninth out of 12 in the percentage of our uh, GDP that we spend on R&D, so that's something that we need to look at correcting. Um, <clears throat> and whilst the number of private sector um, enterprises is at a record high, we're still only ninth in the UK in terms of new business registrations, with only 50 new business registrations per 10,000 of the adult population in 2016, compared to a UK figure of 67. So we need to <clears throat> do our bit to stimulate our young people to want to maybe set up and go out on their own. And we'll talk about uh, fintech and the, that very exciting world of fintech, which um, in, in banking and FS is links into what my colleague over there was talking about with e-commerce. And levels of inv business investment like the UK as a whole remain lower than many of our competitors elsewhere. However, with the recent announcement of the Scottish National Investment Bank, I think that will be another lever, if you like, and button we can push and pull ourselves. So that's just a bank banking and FS overview, but I hope that's helpful to, to everyone around the table. Okay. Um, the 10-year horizon is an interesting one to look at from my perspective. Uh, within the video game industry, 10 years ago, many of us in sort of the SME side of video games development were looking uh, in, you know, with, with a lot of trepidation as to what was to come. You know, it would seem that bigger corporations with ever bigger budgets were starting to dominate the industry. Uh, but the great news is uh, we were completely wrong. And the last 10 years, because of democratization of distribution through uh, digital platforms, effectively, rather than through physical retail, you know, so we always you know, bemoan the fact that the high street is, uh, is shrinking and it's becoming less important, and that's a terrible thing for us all. The flip side of that is, for small creative businesses, the distribution models being online have completely opened up a market rather than being completely restricted by uh, large-scale distributors who would sh effectively decide what the public was going to buy by uh, distribution alone. I, and that's led to, in the past 10 years, a plethora of enormous growth, businesses being created almost out of nothing. Um, and Scotland has significantly benefited in that. In the high end, of course, uh, a stone's throw from the parliament here, we have what's reputed to be the most valuable video games property, actually the most valuable entertainment property in the world in Grand Theft Auto, uh, being developed by Rockstar North. Who, you know, who knows putting an exact figure on it, but the franchise value is certainly north of uh, seven or eight billion, uh, probably mo more, than, more than 10 billion now. Um, and that's principally created here, here in Scotland. I, our own 4J Studios, uh, which I'm chairman, we've been fortunate enough to be the console partner for PlayStation, um, Nintendo, and Microsoft formats uh, for Minecraft. So Minecraft is a franchise created by one individual in Sweden who, within five years of creating the franchise, sold it to Microsoft for two and a half billion dollars. Um, and it continues uh, the most successful console uh, development history on Xbox 360 being the one developed in Scotland uh, continues to be developed in Scotland today. Um, very recently, I, an independent, uh, quite large-scale business in America acquired a small Edinburgh company called Cloudgen, um, and this company is called Epic, who happened to be, I think, 20% owned by the Chinese giant Tencent, which is now 
uh, approaching becoming the biggest video games company in the world with, I think, a market capitalization of half a trillion dollars. Um, and they, if anyone has a uh, knowledge of the video games industry, are responsible for a game called Fortnite, which is reputed to be generating revenues of something like $100 million a month um, at the moment. Uh, and that's from a standing start a few months ago. So these industries are accelerating to an order of magnitude uh, above where they were 10 years ago. The opportunities for small businesses to enter uh, are, are significant. Uh, we in Scotland have created some of these businesses. Uh, there's a venture capital-backed business in Scotland called Outplay. Outplay is in the sort of free-to-play mobile space, um, and it's seen significant growth uh, with principal backing from Scottish investors. So we've got a really bright outlook um, in that core video game sector, um, and what we need uh, are, are more talented individuals to come in, both indigenously created. So University of Aberdeen is obviously uh, Dundee is is clearly uh, a shining light globally in terms of uh, training and and uh, development of individuals for for this sector. But the core of our uh, STEM subjects uh, in Scotland are delivering great people. Um, indeed, some of the skills that we don't have at the moment are are more in the what, what are called the live operations, how you not just develop the games, but then how you publish them and how you engage your audience moving forward. And they're, they're marketing, um, digital marketing skills, discoverability skills, those kind of things, and shared very much in common with, with uh, industries like e-commerce. Um, so more of that, um, and when I say more of it, I, you know, I mean I, substantially more. When I talk, I've just come back from our annual game developer conference in San Francisco, and I talked to a number of people interested in starting and supporting businesses here in Scotland, and the one question they asked is, are there enough people? Is it worth my while coming here? Uh, will I find the people? And obviously my immediate answer is, of course there are. Uh, the more nuanced answer is, of course there will be if we invest, and we need to overinvest in this sector. We'll probably need to make some tough decisions not to invest elsewhere, but these are the skills and they're very transferable. And briefly, to add to that, our other two businesses in Scotland that we've started in the last 10 years, uh, one in television data analytics for television advertising called TV Squared, who are here in Edinburgh. Um, over the past five years, TV Squared's grown from a startup idea to a company operating globally with some of the biggest brand names in the world, uh, you know, analysing their television output. Uh, the other businesses just started in Dundee called Broker Insights, which operates in the commercial insurance space. Both of these businesses have one big thing in common. They couldn't have existed 10 years ago. 10 years ago, there really wasn't um, a platform like, for example, e AWS, Amazon Web Services, or cloud-based computing in the way there is today. That revolution has allowed people with amazing ideas, but not enormous amounts of capital that need to be invested in hardware and infrastructure, to realise these ideas and build businesses of tremendous growth and scale. Those businesses are incredibly close to success stories in Scotland, like Skyscanner and FanDuel, in terms of the, the market environment that's allowed them to grow. The market environment is there. It's now all about deployment of skill base. Um, and if there's any restriction to growth for those companies, it's a restriction, of, you know, one of, one of skill, not access to capital anymore, not access to, uh, to the right core idea generation talent, but the development and scale talent. And scaling is our, our biggest challenge from here on in. Right. Thank you. What we'll do now, I think, is move on to some questions from Gordon MacDonald, followed by some from Kezia Dugdale, and try and bring in our other guests who, who may wish to bring in some comment on these aspects, as well as the what Gordon MacDonald's going to come on to. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, Chris is very uh, helpfully led into some of the questions I, I was wanting to ask, which is, what are the opportunities that you could see being replicated across the, across the economy, and what would the challenges be in actually trying to um, select these key growth areas and replicating them? So you've touched upon it, but what about other panel mem members? Where, where are the opportunities in your sector that could benefit the Scottish economy? I think um, Peter Moforth wanted to come in. In, in, in part, it's, 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 this is a, a direct answer to your question, but to start off, I, I, I just wanted to say a few little more background things about e-commerce. Um, there's there's th two people have already mentioned the, the topic. If, if, if all the, those around the table were asked, what are the top 20 or top, top 50 e-commerce businesses in Scotland, 
I think everybody would probably have a question mark. They wouldn't really know what the, what those top e-commerce businesses were. You know, companies that trade online and, and sell products and services uh, through through the internet. This is really surprising when, if, if you go and look at the most recent statistics from the ONS, it says that the total e-commerce turnover within the UK is £511 billion. Pounds. That's absolutely huge. You know, th these aren't my numbers. You can, you, you, can, you can go to Google and check them. And um, f for some reason, I, I, I spend a lot of time moving around within the UK and when I move, when I, when I go down to England to do business, I find the term e-commerce is used very frequently and regularly, and yet it's not a word that's in common usage within, within the, the Scottish business community, maybe to the same extent. I just a few minutes ago looked on Adzuna, which is um, a website that pulls together all the jobs that are available across all sites within the UK. And just within London, as of about six minutes ago, uh, there were 3,126 e-commerce jobs available in London. And for the whole of Scotland, there were 114. You know, and, and that in itself speaks, you know, some interesting statistics about, you know, the degree of interest here and our sort of understanding of the subject. In terms of what we can do about it, I think so much of this comes down to, I have to answer your question, so much of this is down to skills. Um, uh, I'm, uh, a long time ago I used to be a, a university lecturer and I'm sort of really embarrassed that for something that is as technically specialised as e-commerce, which, which is a very distinct sub, sub, subject. Um, e-commerce web design is different to web design, e-commerce marketing is different to digital marketing. It's a very specific topic. As of, as of today, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't a single college or a single university anywhere in Scotland that runs a dedicated course on e-commerce. And that I find really, really surprising. We've, we've, had, we've been advertising jobs in my own company to recruit engineers within um, the area of e-commerce and they're hen's teeth. You, you, you cannot find them, you cannot recruit them. There is an absolute dearth of um, uh, training, skills, knowledge, expertise uh, here and I, I, I think if, 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 there's, if there's one thing that, that, that we need to focus on um, then, it, then, it, then it's getting these skills. And it's not just specialist companies like us. One of the great things about e-commerce, uh, I, I suspect even more so than fintech, is that it directly applies to lots and lots of small companies, these SMEs. Um, lots of small SMEs can take, and very quickly and immediately, as, as I think Emil mentioned, can take advantage of e-commerce and sell on a global market if they knew what, if they could get the people to get the advice, to have the skills, to be able to, to be able to create wealth, exports, jobs, but it's difficult to know how how to get started, and it, actually it all comes back to a lack of skills. And um, Emil mentioned the, the this 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 fledgling organisation called the Institute of E-Commerce has has no funding and support. It's got the backing of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the backing of the Scotland Food and Drink, the backing of, of Scotland IS, but these and and about twenty companies. But this is all a token gesture unless we can mobilise a, 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 a group support to say, okay, guys, let's let, let, let's try and do something about it. Skill shortage is it just a skill shortage in Scotland or is it something that affects most of Europe or the world because there was a report came out last year that said there was something in the region of 150,000 ICT vacancies across the, across Europe um, e-commerce is a very is a very specific niche niche subject um, uh, the skills are very specific uh, um, uh, uh, to it and because because Personally, I feel the, the, the higher education system has completely failed in being able to address it. The reasons behind that are interesting. Um, it, it, it part, in part because people don't know where, where to fit it. It doesn't fit naturally within 
um, the, the, the government agencies models, and this is why, I mean, if you go to skills, I mean, I, in, the, in the document I, I sort of sent out, you go to Skills Development Scotland, type in e-commerce, nothing, it, it, which, is, which, which is shocking. I, I, I feel if you go to uh, SDI's w website again, there's 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 nothing. Um, how, how how do we start? We, we've got to, we've got to almost bootstrap what is already a colossal industry, and the UK as a whole is the third biggest player in e-commerce in the world. We used to be number one five years ago, remarkably. We're now second fiddle to China and the United States, but within that. 99% of all the e-commerce activity is in Greater London and the English Midlands. And, and it means that whilst the average Scot is just as likely to buy things, whether you're business to consumer or business to business, because most e-commerce is business to business, um, uh, when, 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 we, when we're buying stuff, we're replacing local Scottish uh, uh, companies who would have sold to us by, by, by companies that, 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 are, that are down in England. So our e-balance of trade is considerably worse than our normal balance of trade, I suspect, if we had the statistics. Thank you. Ryan Saha wanted to make comment, and also Louise Smith, before we come to um, <coughs> questions from Kezia Dugdale. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, from the evidence already provided in this session, a lot of the uh, underpinning commonality is around data analytics, uh, data science. Um, and that is uh, a lot of the companies we talk about, TV Squared is an analytics company, e-commerce is driven uh, to a large extent by data analytics, fintech, financial services, it's a, it's a huge part of it. So when you're talking about potential skill shortages, I think uh, that is one which has a a global skill shortage. Uh, I like to think that the work that we're doing at the Data Lab is trying to resolve that in some way. Um, just to give one example, our, um, our master's programme across 11 Scottish universities has grown from 40 to, to 160 within a few, a few years, and there's no difficulty in filling those places. The University of Edinburgh has uh, one of the most, you know, world's leading informatics departments and something we should be very proud of, um, and, but it's providing people for the world. Um, I think when it comes to economic growth in the future, um, data analytics can be essential to that, but it's about creating the skills so that we can have clustered companies. And I think to create clusters of economic growth, you need to have um, a broad base uh, of skills, and, and I think we're, we're getting close to doing that, but we need to keep on investing in data analytic skills in particular. Um, Just on that point, you were saying about creating clusters. Mm. Edinburgh's got an ambition to become one of the data capitals of Europe. I mean, we heard about the skill shortages in e-commerce, but is there particular issues in, in Edinburgh trying to achieve that ambition? I think Edinburgh is in a very good position, not because, not least because of the University of Edinburgh, but also because of the universities and because of developments that SDS have been doing um, to try and boost both cybersecurity but also then data analytics at college level as well. Um, to, to meet that skill shortage, we can rely... We can't just rely on universities. We also need to be getting people from school and into college to, to be doing the broad base of data level jobs, of data management. And so I think um, modern apprenticeship and data analytics is very important. Um, I think Edinburgh is very well positioned, but it needs to work with Glasgow as well uh, across the central belt, um, which also has a lot of its expertise. I'll quote Johnson, a very brief follow-up, and then to Louise Smith. Absolutely, Joshua. You mentioned um, you actually mentioned kind of going back, back in school, but how early? Because obviously we're going to want these students coming through and being able to go into these courses at 16, 18. How early do they need to be uh, taking subjects which will which will feed them into that into that process? Well, I think um, I think it needs to start very early. So you'll see, um, I think, from previous Royal Society reports around uh, computing within schools that the UK was was behind and I know there's been a drop in computing teachers as well so I think the there needs to be investment first of all computing uh, from primary school upwards um, but also uh, statistics so understand and, and maths so so those are, are some key areas but I don't want to also focus too much on, on data analytics of course I think it's very important but I think from what Chris mentioned earlier about creativity and the creative professions and, and the combination of creativity and technology is where um, some of Scotland's pre-existing strengths can really be built on. Uh, so 
I think the biggest gap at the moment at, at primary, secondary school is perhaps computing, maybe statistics, but we don't want to uh, um, diminish the great work we're doing in, in creative learning as well. Thank you. Um, Louise Smith. Just to add to the skill piece, because we're talking about how do we attract new talent in terms of whether that's working with schools and universities, particularly schools actually, and I know there are several examples of where we're uh, creating code clubs where we're trying to get more people into um, those particular areas quicker. But actually, it's also, we have a strong workforce here already, is how do we work with those people to redeploy them, upskill them, and also help them actually move into roles where today they're probably unknown. I just wanted to make a couple of points. Fundamentally, and I, Chris, and I think Chris raised it and Graham, it, it, it's now a customer-driven market. And actually, I think with particularly fintech, providing more choice is a healthy one, but actually also means from an organisation perspective, whether those are large existing organisations or new ones, is unless you've got customer at the heart of that, it's not a sustainable model. We're already seeing examples, strong examples, of where people are collaborating. Again, it's a simple strategy. I personally believe collaboration and partnership, whether that's on skills, talent, startups, uh, people moving into Scotland is absolutely critical for how we move forward. And then thirdly, those are challenging how we work in terms of whether we're agile, innovative, and also whether we're fast enough. So I think in terms of some of those challenges are global, they're not unique here, but there is a very clear and strong targeted focus, I think, on two or three areas that we in Scotland have an opportunity to really harness. And on to a question from Kezia Dugdale. I feel like I've um, heard from Scotland IS for several years now that Scotland has a digital skills gap, but it doesn't appear to get much better as each year goes by. So I'm wondering what sort of fundamental shift we need to address that, what it looks like. Where are the feelings in the higher education sector? I think you referenced that uh, there have been problems to this point. And um, where are the problems within the enterprise and skills agencies in terms of their deliverability when it comes to this problem? And if it's not about new um, Scots entering these careers, or reskilling, as Louise has mentioned, I think that's a really key point, given that only 15% of Scottish SMEs are actually properly digitised at the moment. If we're having to look beyond Scotland's borders to attract new skills, what impact does Brexit have? There's a nice, easy question for you all. Um, Graham Jones, would you like to come in on that? Oh, thank you. Delighted to, be, to, to go off first. Well, firstly, can I just say, by the way, Chris, uh, everything that you said there really chimed with me. And one of the one well, of the things that would be great to do is if you and I can have a chat about how we can maybe come together on some of the stuff that we're doing in financial services. Because I think that if you look at people who are looking for things like retirement advice, how do you make it entertaining for them to track <coughs> their, you know, their pension funds and what their options are and so on and so forth? So I can't think of a better person to come and speak to than yourself, but uh, I must get back to the question. Again, I can only speak, Kezia, for banking and financial services because I'm a monoline sector. We have great collaboration with SDS. They probably, I would speak to SDS once a week on average and they form part of, part of a network we've called STAR, Skills, Training and Research. Um, and that's, as I say, is dedicated towards banking and financial services, but SDS are part of it, uh, Scottish Enterprise are part of it, SDI are part of it. We work closely with them. Now, at the moment, just now, we have enough computing science graduates and digitally skilled people coming in who are attracted to our biggest financial services brands. And what I do really, it does chime with me, uh, with what, Peter, you were saying, is the difficulty, of course, is if they're being hoovered up, if you like, by the large brands, large successful brands, then the further, if you like, the smaller an enterprise that you are, the more difficult it becomes to recruit, recruit staff. And you may have to pay, if you like, over the odds to do that. So from that point of view, what we're doing with Star Network is saying, how do we address these shortfalls? We have 11 universities, funnily enough, who are part of that. And these 11 universities work hand in glove with us. So what we're trying to do is to match if you like, our anticipated demand going forward with the types of graduates we'll require. And we also have a, an unknown box, which is, uh, uh, Louise was alluding to, is we also know that there's some stuff that will happen nobody knows of at the moment, because as you were saying to Chris 10 years ago, uh, Minecraft and uh, Grand Theft Auto couldn't have existed in the way that it does at the present moment in time. So, so certainly at a, at a banking FS level, we're, we're getting great support there. Um, I think there's still a lot more that we can do in fine-tuning uh, 
what we're doing in terms of making sure the children who are coming out of school are you know work ready and go into apprenticeships if that's more suitable for them not everybody needs to go to university so we want all those children to go in there but they need to have the right stem subjects so just to the point my colleague on my left was saying there is we need to we're really pitching in and working with the schools to make sure we're being attractive uh, the industry is being attractive to to children who want to to aspire to move into financial services reskilling i'm totally with you on that one uh, the rate the world is changing at so in my 40 years when i started there were no mobile telephones there were no desktop pcs if you wanted something typed you went to the typing pool and asked very very nicely and the chief typist might type your dic di di dictaphone tape so if i think of the change i've gone through and the adaptations i've had to be made uh, had to make probably i've had maybe Ostensibly, but I'm still on good old-fashioned banking and FS man, but I've probably had four careers. And, and that's at the pace that was very much slower. So I think, so I think going forward, I, I, I agree with what everyone's saying there, but certainly from a banking and FS point of view, Kezi, we, are very, we work very, very closely with the universities and with the Scottish Government institutions to make sure we're matching that demand with supply. And Joshua Ryan Saha and then Chris van der Kyle wanted to come in as well. Yeah, I, I just want to talk, I guess, a bit with the question you answered around um, the persistence of a digital skills gap. I think partially there's just global growth in digital jobs. And as I mentioned before, University of Edinburgh, other universities uh, providing people for the world, not just not just for Scotland. Um, I think there's some good things that are going on here. I think CoClan's a good example of uh, for both lifelong learning but also different routes. I think... Um, we have to do more in keeping people here. Um, and I think that's partially selling Scotland. So um, one of the things we do and a lot of universities do in a lot of different places is make sure they have a placement within a Scottish company. Um, so they get that first step in the door and then they have a, a greater affinity. I think developing a community of people so that they've got connections within Scotland so they feel like they don't need to move um, is quite important. I think uh, lifelong learning, just to, to reiterate that, um, the majority of people who are working 20 years from now are working now. So um, one of the, the key skills for the future is being able to be adaptable and relearn. So we need to have an infrastructure that enables people to keep on learning the skills that are required, in particular in, in technology. Um, I think... I don't think we do. Not, not, in, the, not in the same way it's, it's developed at younger levels. I think um, the universities are changing so they can provide more in-work training. Um, you need to be able to offer a broad diff different range so people who are time poor can access training either online um, or, or elsewhere but also people who are financially poorer how can they access training 10 15 years down the line and I think things like the digital growth fund is an opportunity there and um, how, how that can be targeted people in work um, and then the final thing you mentioned around Brexit uh, I think it is a risk because the uh, still around 50%, I think, of the people on our courses are coming from Europe. Um, so there's a potential risk that we, we lose those, but it, it, it just refocuses us on being, making sure that from every university, from every school, from every college, there's an opportunity for people to retrain quickly. So we need to, to um, manage that risk by reinvesting in the pipeline towards university, I think. And Chris van der Kyle, then Louise Smith, then Emil Strickland. So to, e to echo and develop my uh, my colleagues' comments, I mean, I think the the, the statement that I keep reflecting on is is the one that you know we've never lived in a period of change as fast as the one we live in now, and it will never be this slow again. You know, so everything you've experienced in the past forty years suddenly starts to compress and compress into the next five years or so, and and. Kezi, to answer your question directly, there is an unlimited appetite for skills, the kind of skills we're talking about. So we can never do enough because as much as we do, we'll just only attract more people. And then we'll complain and moan a bit that, oh, goodness me, there's not enough people. But that's fine because growth will be going through the roof and we'll have an, you know, an ever more unsustainable appetite for more great people if we skill them in the right way. Um, and that, to your point, is, uh, is, is severely lacking. You know, we're not, from the early stage, we're not building a, a, a confidence and a belief in our young people that this is something for them. If, if I hear once more up in Dundee, oh, it's all right for you guys in the games and digital industries in Dundee, what about the rest of us that have been left behind in manufacturing? My answer is, 
you're left behind if you think that manufacturing in the way it is, was 30 years ago is ever going to come back. You know, if you understand, anyone in my view is capable of understanding gradations of the skills that we're talking about here. There's no reason to leave anyone behind in, in our workforce. But if we continue to believe that training for an old economy is the right way to go, we'll consign ourselves to, you know, to the backwaters of, of economic history. Um, so, so with that focus going forward, I think there was a brilliant point made by, uh, by Joshua earlier around the combination of creativity and digital. Other countries, and we can all name them, can hothouse young people to be the best mathematicians that they can possibly be, or um, actually in a very narrow field, brilliant data analysts. But the kind of minds that we traditionally have been brilliant in developing in Scotland, that are lateral, that are multicultural, that are reaching across all sorts of divides, brings the kind of unique nature to Scotland that's seen us lead the way in things like video games design and music and, and, and film and exporting some of that talent outside. So, so we, we need, must continue to do that. And to your final point on the impact of Brexit, you know, the confusing thing to me over the past few years has been an obsession with some kind of isolationism or even an obsession with Europe because it's kind of irrelevant to us now, a European culture or UK, it's global. You know, we, we need to make sure that there's access to every market we can possibly access to. And, and I suppose if there's an opportunity in the situation we find ourselves in now, it's making sure that we set ourselves up for success, that we're incredibly attractive, both inwardly and outwardly. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of migration cycle, uh, you know, we don't want to keep everybody to ourselves because if we keep everybody to ourselves, uh, you know, who will know what we're doing and who, who will understand what to bring back to Scotland? And at the same time, if we set our flag and set our stall out as being the place you come if you want to develop creative and technically advanced businesses and you'll find the best young talent coming through and you'll find a, a home that welcomes you to do that, we'll do brilliantly. Pretty simple. And we need to take a not just a 10-year, but a sort of 30, 40, 50-year view of that and make those changes now. And we've not. We're playing at it. You know, we... We, we sort of, uh, you know, make great noises um, around, and, and actually great strategic insights into things like curriculum for excellence. Then we underfund it and we wonder why it doesn't deliver. It's not because the strategy was wrong, it's because the implementation was atrocious. Um, and that's what we need to address and address it with the reality of if we want a growing economy, if we want to fund our services and an, an ever-growing and ageing population, we need to develop these core skills which will generate huge value for the country. Right. Um, Louis Smith, Emil Strickland, and I think Peter Moforth would also like to come in. So I just wanted to add four points to that, and actually two of them Chris has covered. I think you're right. We also need to talk about what does digital skill gap actually really mean anymore, because even that's changed in today's world. We've talked about how you actually, even financial services, we work really closely now with the creative industries. We wouldn't have done that previously. So I think we've actually got to talk about this in a different way. What do we actually mean? What types of skills? We then talk about the technology and actually we're missing a whole section around, and you touched on it, Chris, around that human interface into technology. How do we create the right designs for customers to adapt and adopt quickly and also gain confidence and security in some of these new changes? How do you then maintain and operationalise some of these components? So I think there's a real opportunity for us to actually break down what do we mean by digital skills gap. So firstly, people understand it and then create a targeted strategy to then constantly deliver against it. I think Chris is bang on. It's not a quick silver bullet around this is suddenly going to shift. This is a leadership challenge, and we need to continue to drive against that strategy. My last point is, is around, and again, Chris touched on it, confidence, belief, and ambition. We need to help people adapt uh, with confidence and with real ambition against those targeted strategies. And that means it's consistent, and we've got to be persistent about it. Um. Yeah, so um, from from my point of view, e-commerce probably differs slightly to some of the other uh, industries around the table because there is a lack of kind of public awareness in it. There are some fantastic case studies around data, some fast, fantastic case studies certainly around the computer games industry within Scotland and also fintech. But where are the large e-commerce companies? Now, they exist. There are 
companies doing amazing things. Over 100 million turnover retailers. There are small little retailers growing at 200, 300% a year, but we don't hear about them. There's no one talking about them. Maybe it's because e-commerce is, is not a, a kind of hot topic in the, in the same way, or, or maybe we, you know, we just don't like those, those particular industries that they operate in. Um, but I think the first step in how to make e-commerce better, certainly, is to raise the awareness. And then, of course, there is, there is training. And I think community plays also a huge role in um, how we move forward as a, as a kind of e-commerce country. Because if you go down to London, there are meetups, there are little groups of people that come together and just talk about e-commerce. They just go, hey, so uh, we tried this thing and we got an in improved conversion rate of 0.1% and it cost us a very small amount of money. Why don't you go away and try that for your, your uh, business? And that's how you begin to build on the skills that, that need to be put in place by training. You need a kind of base level of skills, but the community helps that. And part, um, I think part of the reason why computer games is so successful is there is that community. Certainly FinTech is incredibly successful because Edinburgh is a, is a kind of global financial you know, hub. But we don't have that in e-commerce. And I think if we don't begin to build that, we're in danger of seriously losing out. I mean, there's a statistic I read the other day. By 2040, 95% of all... Uh, purchases will involve some form of e-commerce. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to be buying online, but there is a part in that consumer journey that has an interaction online through some form of e-commerce marketing. And I think it's important that, that we build on that uh, and that we're aware of it. In terms of how much impact Brexit is going to have, uh, who knows, but the, there are a number of countries who are, we're already doing big amounts of trade with. Uh, it, the UK, rather, is doing big amounts of trade with online. And if you look at um, the, the US, 9% of US consumers are happy to buy uh, UK products from UK websites, and 6% of Chinese consumers. Bear in mind, the Chinese market is five times larger. The Chinese e-commerce market is five times larger than that of the UK. So there are all the, already these consumers out there. In fact, I'm, I'm aware, I was made aware by Peter of a company who are already selling like 85% of their business goes to mainland China in huge volumes. And they're growing at sort of 200% a year. They can't keep up. No one knows about these companies, but it's happening. And we just need to champion that and, and build on, on what's there already. Thank you. And Peter, more forth before we come to questions from John Mason. I think uh, Louise made a, a, very, a very good point about what exactly do we mean by a, a digital skills gap? Because um, as, as, a, as an observer, I, I've seen a big, a, a, a lot of things said about, you know, we need digital skills and things. But it's almost like it's a pervasive perfume that cuts, because let's, let's face it, almost, you know, so many things in, in our lives at, at home and at work. Uh, are, are, are digital um, these days. Uh, what, what is of particular interest to me is this very focused area around e-commerce for which there is no agenda, there's no agency that takes charge of it, there's no national plan, strategy, uh, there are no courses on it. And considering the size of it, because if you look at the, the numbers, e-commerce is very considerably bigger than um, fintech, and yet you know there isn't there isn't a single a single course out out there on on the subject and maybe it's because it's it's not cool i mean maybe maybe my challenge to the politicians around the table is when did you last um talk about e-commerce you know ask you, each of you ask ask yourself that question when did you actually last bring up a question about it um i mean we had in the uh, I, I was in, invited along to the um business in the parliament event uh, towards the end of last year, and we actually had a, a session on it. And, I, I'm, I'm, and it, it, it's a, that was a fantastic activity, by, by the way. It gave me good insight into what goes on h here in the, in, in, in the Scottish Parliament. Um, but, but it was really interesting that the politician said, this isn't really a subject that we've s spoken about. We don't talk about it. When, you know, how often did, did people mention it? And for something that... Um, for, it's rather unfortunate that... Emil and I are 
both from the e-commerce industry, we're both guys. Half, half the businesses that are e-commerce businesses in Scotland are led by women. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a very sort of equal opportunities kind of business because, because people who run it can have a lot of flexibility if they're setting up a, a fashion business or something, or what, whatever. Um, 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 there's a fantastic welding business in Glasgow run, run, run by uh, uh, a woman who's creating billions of pounds worth of, worth of online sales. But as Emil said, nobody knows about this. It's not, for some reason, e-commerce is just not cool. Right? Nobody talks about it. it. It's like Voldemort in, in Harry Potter. It's the biggest thing and nobody talks about it. Um, you've mentioned twice about Scottish Enterprise. I'm looking at Scottish Enterprise website. They're running workshops on practical steps to grow your business through e-commerce, benefits of e-commerce, boost your e-commerce skills, best practice guidance, select and target in your markets, mm -hmm. culture and language considerations, and there's a whole host of things that you can do. And you, you're saying there's God, nothing God, on the a, website about last Scottish night. Enterprise. All, all of those courses are run either by, um, by staff at Scottish Enterprise or by a teaching company. Nobody actually from the industry is involved in the provision of those, of those courses. You know, this is like if you, if, if, if you were going to be taught heart surgery, would, would you want to be taught by a teaching company or by somebody who, who, who'd actually done, done surgery in, 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 the, in the subject? If you look at all the events that are run, run by, by, by Scottish Enterprise, there are a number of events that mention, mention e-commerce, but for things like um, international trade, it's largely the, the culture is one of, 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 of going overseas, going on a, on a, on a, on a, on a trade um, if, event. You know, it's different, different parts of the world. Th those tend to dominate the events run, run by the agencies, whereas so much of modern trade is just done at a click of a button. As, as Emil said, there are loads of companies that can sell directly into China with millions of pounds worth of turnover. They don't need... need you know, to, to actually go on a trade mission to do it. So you, you just list some products on Alibaba and off you go. Well, that is um, certainly a, a good plug for e-commerce, but it may be that the, the, those involved need to try and engage a bit more with Scottish Enterprise to, to put that message across. And, of course, part of you being here is, in fact, um, bringing that, that message and these comments to us here. Um, I'd like to move on now to, to John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener, and actually Dr. Moore, Moreforth uh, kind of touched on some of this because, I mean, we're interested in business growth, but we're also interested in inclusive growth. And so I'm interested in your thoughts as to how your sectors are uh, providing that, dealing with that, or whether that's not an issue that's really on your agenda. I mean, the, the obvious one is that women have just been mentioned here. I mean, uh, clearly amongst the witnesses today it is largely male-dominated. Frankly, amongst the committee, it's also male-dominated, although two of our colleagues are not here. Um, so, I mean, is, are your industries, your sectors, ones where the men make the big bucks and the women make the coffee, or is it inclusive? Who would like to answer that? Um, Joshua Ryan Saha. Quick start. I think uh, from uh, the data analytics community, uh, it's still it is still mostly male dominated, um, and at computing more broadly. I just quickly mention the data lab is actually the CEO is Gillian Doherty, and there's a, a, a gender balance across the organisation. Um, there, when we think about future jobs, there is a risk that those who potentially um, don't benefit from data science or automation and, and that sort of thing are those from poorer backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and also the roles that are typically um, likely to be replaced are going to be those mostly filled with women as well. So I think there's a, a challenge. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity as well. So when we talk about automation, there's always this risk of, of getting quite negative, and rightly so, there's, there's risk for some people. There's actually a huge growth of jobs as well, and some of those we don't know what they are yet. What we do know is we need to help those people who are in the social economic backgrounds that are least likely to be able to fill those high, new high skill jobs. So the way that we're thinking about it, both within the Edinburgh City region deal discussions, but also at the Data Lab and also our partners in SC and elsewhere, uh, SDS in particular, is making sure that we get people at an earlier stage, as already previously mentioned, into those um, creative 
technical, get those skills early on. Um, and also, again, if you are potentially at risk of um, maybe technology-related redundancy, how do you very quickly identify that risk and how do you put them through a lifelong training program, which means they can take opportunity and take advantage of those opportunities that are coming up as well. We need to make sure that we continue to invest in the new technological innovation, but also match that investment in making sure that the people who get into those um, roles are coming from uh, the broad range of backgrounds. Okay, thank you. I'm Louise Smith and Chris Van um, So I probably should comment on this as a, uh, a technology uh, leader who's female, but I think we need to be really clear about what we mean by this again. So I think most organisations have targeted strategies to get um, more representation in its broadest sense in senior levels in organisations. With my Royal Bank of Scotland hat on, we're no different. Um, we've got stretching targets in the right and new roles. Uh, we're doing well against those targets. We're already at 37% in um, senior positions. With my fintech hat on and what we're seeing more of is actually a couple of things is around how do we engage schools and we're doing specific areas. I see many different ones. Joshua has commented on a couple of them where we're actually opening up what those new skills look like, whether that's through technology type of um, courses, whether that's through design, creative industries or what that may look like. So I think there's more targeted strategies now. Uh, I think we need to do more. Um, I think the second thing is, with an increase in infrastructure, we're also being able to access new talent. And I'd like to make that more broader than gender, but actually people who do need to work remotely, who do want to work at home, but have the new skills that we've talked about, is we can now access those people that we couldn't do before, because I think people see less going to an office as the only way in which you can actually recruit and attract talent. So I'm seeing more and more targeted strategies in this space, I think we need to do a lot more. Uh, and again, I think we need to be persistent on that strategy. Can I just follow up? I mean, you, you said like RBS now, as I understand it, they're, they're a big organisation. Mm -hmm. They've got people within it who are deliberately trying to promote women and, mm -hmm. and give women every opportunity. Is it harder for a small business, a startup, to you know have all that in place? I, I don't know whether it's harder or easier. I think the challenges are different. Uh, for larger organisations and smaller ones. Um, I think we need to talk about case studies more, we need to talk about stories more, whether that's in smaller organisations, some of the stuff Joshua's talked about. I think some people would probably argue some of those are best kept secrets to, to want of a, a, a better degree. I think in organisations we're seeing, in my organisation we're seeing more and more of that. So I don't know whether it's harder, I think it's different challenges. Um, we need to give access um, to those individuals, but I do think we need to be really targeted about it rather than generic. Yep. Um, my, my comments would really be around, uh, in terms of diversity challenge, I'd reflect back on a point I made earlier about an unlimited appetite for talent. Um, it would seem to be pure madness if one is looking to only be able to take a certain percentage of a of a, a population into our industry to in any way, either by design or, or by accident, artificially restrict or restrict I, the, the pool in which you're recruiting from. So if there's 100% of the population and I can only take 5% of them in, I want 5% of everybody, yeah. uh, no matter where they come from, background, gender, uh, sexual orientation or, or otherwise, it's kind of, you know, it's missed opportunity along the way. And our industry was, was, was very interesting in that very clearly in talking about the computer games industry, we came from a place where in the 1980s home computing was principally the domain of young males below the age of, of 16. And, and the industry now, are, uh, you know, there's a lot of senior people like me who were exactly of that, uh, that type, i.e. an absolute geek uh, when I was a, a small child. Um, and we've struggled with it because you know we've we've been the leaders of the pack and you know and on it's gone and we've had a in this interesting microcosm uh, an industry that looked very uh, you know very much populated by that audience and we've worked really hard over the, again the past decade as we've realised very quickly that 50% of our audience is female that everyone plays computer games 
Uh, if we're going to make games that appeal to everyone, we need a representation uh, as wide as we possibly can. Um, so to that, we, we work pretty hard now making sure the environment works for everybody. You know, where, whereas you know, the classic sort of uh, stereotypes of the early days where it was all about um, you know, pinball machines and table tennis tables and everything, sometimes other things are important to people in terms of work-life balance and those things. And, and I've seen a real transition in our industry and that's got to continue, otherwise we will miss some of the greatest talents that our industry could ever see because we don't create an environment that feels welcoming to them. So, so you know, all my colleagues in the industry, I, I think we all agree, and it's very high on the agenda. If you, go, if you went to Game Developer Conference last week, again, inclusivity and encouragement of diversity, and not just as a token, really, because it absolutely impacts on what we do every single day. So, you know, I would hope that we're seen as an industry that's open to, to anyone. Um, I think Jamie Halker Johnson had a very brief follow-up. Yeah, it was kind of tied into the inclusiveness uh, um, uh, kind of idea. Uh, obviously, um, trying to get more women involved in, in your sectors, trying to get perhaps the opportunities for disabled people, but also the regional diversity. I represent the Highlands and Islands, um, and one of the big barriers to e-commerce and uh, you know um, doing more uh, ordering online and, and developing online is the infrastructure. It's simply not there in the broadband infrastructure. I was wondering how that can play a role, uh, in, you know, how important that would be to getting that right in the future, whether it's in the highlands and islands where broadband speeds are very low or even other areas where they're maybe not, not, not big enough to kind of meet modern, modern requirements. Chris? Um, yeah, I mean, the broadband is, is a national disgrace. You know, I, I would call in a committee, let's happily call out BT Openreach as a national disgrace. Um, you know, they do not deliver what they say they're going to deliver when they say they're going to deliver it. And I'm sure they would come here and argue that I'm completely wrong. But we should not in 2018 be able to listen to the statement you just made that there are poor bandwidth areas in Scotland, anywhere in Scotland. My understanding is one of the bright lights and shining lights uh, of the last economic downturn was that for the first time in our immediate history, there was not a mini Highland clearance. And people attribute that down to the fact that some communities, and a lot of communities, had great broadband, so people were able to contribute. And actually, some made a positive choice. This was a time to get out of, uh, you know, main population centres. And everyone that I know that's in my kind of industry, the first thing they look at is, what's the speed in the property that I'm going to look at? What's the speed in the area? And the areas they simply will not move to. Uh, because of that. Um, we've talked about addressing it. We are addressing it. I know the Scottish Government has put in place extra funding, but it's still not enough. You know, a, a, me a measurement measured in megabits isn't enough. You know, it's gigabits of infrastructure, true infrastructure, need to be everywhere if we're going to follow on this promise of Scotland being accessible to, to all these opportunities. Um, otherwise, you simply, you simply can't exist in this so Doing it. We're not delivering the right way and we're not delivering for the future effectively, would you say? We, we're, we're trying hard to do it, but we need to do, we need to do more and, and, and quicker. You know, we, the money that went into the, the Queen's Ferry crossing, in my view, would have had a far bigger economic impact going into a digital infrastructure. Um, maybe controversial for those that commute from Fife. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> right, um, perhaps briefly, Graeme Jones, did you want to come in and then move on to questions from Colin Beattie? Yes, I'll, I'll, I will be brief. I'd just, I'd just like to say, as somebody who, who actually grew up in Dingwall in Rosshire, I really deeply understand the highlands. highlands. I'm passionate about the Highlands, and I totally agree with yourself, Chris. Though there's some incredibly talented, able people that are up there who choose to live up there because of fantastic quality of life. They tend to be creatives. If you don't have the powerful broadband, certainly from a fintech point of view, you're not at the races. Um, so I think it's something that, you know, if, if I felt a sense of urgency about anything, it's about how do you get that piped up and sorted out PDQ. So I'm 100% behind you on that, Chris, and, and likewise, Louise. Thank you. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Yeah, we've uh, touched very briefly on the fact that uh, new startups in Scotland are lower than in the rest of the UK. What do you see as maybe the top two barriers against small companies starting up in Scotland? In your sector, of course. Um, Chris Vanderkyle? 
Sorry, I, did, I was hesitant because I'm right on my hobby horse now, so I don't want to. I, I mean, you know, as, as chairman of Entrepreneurial Scotland, you know, our, our ambition is to make Scotland the most entrepreneurial society in the world. Um, and we truly believe that can be done. And that's a society in which no one sees a barrier to pursuing a great idea. Sometimes it will be a business, sometimes it will be a great idea in teaching. It doesn't matter. It's that, it's that mindset of we can do this and let's get on with it. Um, I, I think the biggest barrier is still some form of, of peer uh, support. You know, you know in, in the most entrepreneurial societies in the world that we look at, people do things because they know that the person next door's done it or somebody in their family's done it and they need that reinforcement. And when you've got a gap of, of no exemplars to follow, you, there is a place for organisations like Scottish Enterprise, like Business Gateway, like local councils, but generally the business community to get involved and spread that message through at the early stage organisations like Young Enterprise, um, et, et cetera. Um, and we just need to keep playing that message through. The great news is, from the 1990s, when I, when I started out, there was a bit of entrepreneurial support. Today, there's fantastic entrepreneurial support networks for people wanting to start businesses. There are great second, third, fourth generation business angels and entrepreneurs that are there to help to provide capital. Um, and I would challenge people to, who say, oh, it's very difficult. It should be quite difficult to raise money and to move things forward. It shouldn't be easy, but there's no barrier to it anymore. It's there. Um, the, the biggest challenge for us is making sure that people can find the routes to do that. There's variability within the Scottish Enterprise Network, undoubtedly. There are unbelievably brilliant people in there who have supported our businesses over the last 20 years. So we know who to go to and we know who the, who the A players are. Um, there's unfortunately people that don't quite reach that mark, that sometimes businesses fall into a trap of being passed from pillar to post with no real strong advice. To take an earlier point, you know, you need people who are practitioners, not just people who are lifetime Scottish Enterprise employees. And the good people that do it in Scottish Enterprise know how to connect, connect those dots. The bigger challenge for Scotland now, I think we're starting to get beyond the startup challenge, whether metrics tell us uh, differently or not, we really are, um, is, is scaling up. You know, and some great insights would be had from things like Skyscanner of late, you know, the... Um, the great uh, Silicon Valley, Welsh-born Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Michael Moritz, who ended up um, as a major investor in Skyscanner, went within two years from saying, I'll never really invest in teams outside Silicon Valley because they're on my doorstep and we know they're the best people in the world, to under Gareth Williams' leadership, Skyscanner is probably the best team I've ever seen in a digital startup, and I can't wait to find more opportunities where they've come from. You know, so the world suddenly is starting to look at Scotland and international capital, uh, which didn't, is, is looking quite tightly at it. The difference between us and, say, the Scandinavian countries, who are similar demographics but outperforming us in startups and scale-ups especially, um, is a real joined-up culture from government to education to the private sector who are promoting things like uh, you know, Slash. There's a big, massive inward investment conference, you would call it, um, around high tech in, in Helsinki that is just blowing the roof off in terms of bringing opportunities to Finland. We have some great success in Edinburgh here with, with EIE, you know, which is driven out of Edinburgh Informatics, but we don't take it seriously enough. We really don't put our shoulder behind the wheel and support it to the scale that, uh, that other countries are doing. Um, so nascent infrastructure is there, but yet again, we're probably not fully committed we leach money into other things that are never going to return for us. Whereas, you know, this is the gold rush. This is where we should be investing our time and effort and money. Thank you. I'll be trying to be entrepreneurial and uh, perhaps bring in some others. Emil Strickland, Louise Smith, and I think um, Joshua, Ryan Saha, and Graham Jones also wanted to come in on this. So we'll start with Emil. Uh, so I, th I think in terms of uh, e-commerce startups, again, it comes down to this level of awareness. And I think if you have... Uh, a, a country or even an area of industry that is heavily aware of the opportunities, that then people are more likely to look into and look at those opportunities. Uh, I think the, the fact that Scotland is indexed around 30 for a search term when other areas of the UK are much, much higher, um, particularly places which perhaps are, are not 
traditionally thought of as great traders. I mean, what, if you look at Scotland's trade history compared to somewhere like Wales, you would hope that Scotland would be performing much better in uh, kind of the latest trends in international trade. Um, and I think having that awareness there um, will encourage people to get involved much, much more, because it's not, it's not difficult. Um, there are loads of case studies from uh, all over the UK. There's a great one. Uh, there's, a, there's a company called Victorian <laughs> Plumbing. Uh, and Victorian Plumbing was started by a guy, I think it was about 15 years ago. Uh, and he was working in Tesco, stacking shelves, and he wanted to start a business. He's, he, his goal was to buy a Ferrari. That's what he really wanted to do. So he started importing uh, mobile phone cases from China and selling them on eBay. And he grew it to the point at which he could afford his Ferrari. And he then sold that business. He then had to, unfortunately, sell his Ferrari uh, to finance a warehouse so that he could import plumbing uh, equipment and, and you know, sinks and basins and things. Uh, today, Victorian plumbing is north of 100 million turnover in 15 years from selling uh, you know, mobile phone parts on eBay. There's, there is a natural progression if you're a startup, if you can spot a niche, but you need to be aware of these niches. And, and then you need, you know, there, there does need to be education around it, and there does need to be those, that support. I mean, um, re recently we ran a workshop with Scottish Edge, um, and Scottish Edge have some amazing small companies, startups, you know, pre-turnover startups, and they're all really interested in learning how to do it but they, they don't have access to that knowledge. Now, I, I know there is stuff through Scottish Enterprise. I know there is stuff through, through Business Gateway, but it's not provided by um, people who, who have actually done it. And, and I don't want to hate on Business Gateway or Scottish Enterprise because I do think they provide an amazing, amazing service. But one example is... Uh, so I'm, I'm particularly interested in international e-commerce and particularly interested how... Um, you know, we can increase exports because I'm uh, just looking at a statistic here that's from, uh, was something done by Boston Consulting Group. And it says, for every one pound spent online to import goods, two pound 80 is exported. The, uh, this is in, in e-commerce. Uh, e and the opposite of true is true of the offline economy, which exports 90 pence for every pound imported. So we're exporting three times much online but the UK, rather, is exporting three times as much online um, as we're, we're uh, importing. So I think that's a, a really important part. And um, when looking at the Scottish Enterprise, uh, Scottish Enterprise International example, the, the two, two areas which held a lot of focus were uh, letters of credit, which aren't really used in, in e-commerce terribly much, I've, I've certainly never used one. Uh, and the other one was translation. Now, if you're not a practitioner, the obvious thing to do if you want to trade overseas is to translate your website, your packaging, your all these things. You go, well, that, that's obvious. That will increase sales, 100%. For anyone in it practicing it knows that often the inverse is true. So... Uh, I mean, there are a number of reasons why people purchase overseas, but uh, one of them is that they trust UK goods. If you look at the, all of the statistics of, of trade, and particularly with language, on average, translation of a website leads to about a 2% increase in sales. Now, unless you're turning over huge amounts of money, the cost of those translations are never going to be brought back to the company. I mean, what, what do you have to turn over? Um, 10 million, 20 million? That, that's hurting <coughs> startups. That's not helping them. Uh, and, and it's just one example of, of how knowing the right steps, like if you're a small company, get your stuff on Amazon, get your stuff on eBay immediately because then you can show that there's a market for your product. And it's having that knowledge and, and just... Having the, the kind of having someone say, look, it's all right, just get your product on eBay. eBay is not full of dodgy ex uh, fake Rolexes anymore, 
like just just go and put it on there and this is how you do it gives people confidence you know if you're if you're thinking of starting up a company if i was thinking of starting up a company my main thing is i can i can make the product i can i know about that but how do i sell it and i you know i don't want to give up my job to have no money trying to sell this product get it online see if there's a market for it and right. Sorry. Thank you. I'm, I'm afraid time is against us. I don't want to dampen anyone's enthusiasm here, and it's good to, to see this amongst our, our guests today. Perhaps um, fairly briefly from Louise, Joshua, and Graham, and then we'll move on to some questions from Andy Whiteman. Louise Smith. Yeah, sure. I'll just make a couple of brief points. Um, in terms of financial services and fintech, we're seeing more and more accelerators, whether that's entrepreneur accelerators. We're also seeing fintech accelerators. Thinking from a Royal Bank of Scotland perspective, we've supported 3,000 entrepreneurs just in the last three years, where they've raised around 250 million pounds worth of capital to support them. So there's lots of places now that we're seeing within the industry where people can get coaching, mentoring, access to infrastructure and capabilities. To answer your specific question around what the top two barriers are, one of them I agree with Chris, it's how do we actually help people understand the support, the routes and the paths beyond startup into high scale up and growth areas and how do you continue that support through probably one of the more trickier periods. So I think that's one of them. I think the second one is, and I know we're starting to get, to use Chris's phrase, our shoulder behind this, we need to make it easier for those organisations, particularly within FS, to be able to partner and work with and collaborate with the industry. And I know there's lots of commitment. We're working on um, a process in which we can help people through those uh, supplier procurement types of um, processes that um, have traditionally been uh, a problem for people, but we need to do that quicker and faster. So I think those are the two areas um, that we can actually, and are within our gift to actually start to address. Um, I'll be very brief. I, I, um, I think, um, just backing what Chris said earlier on, when it comes to Scottish economic performance, scale up, I think, is perhaps uh, even more important than startups at the moment. And the reason being is when um, I think it was a Nesta report looked at job growth, there's two ways that a small country or, or can, can really do that. One is where you have medium or small companies that can grow quite rapidly, and you've seen that with uh, Skyscanner and various other companies. And the other is where you attract new companies to potentially base themselves here. I think, ag again, both those things potentially rely on having a good skills base in, in technology and creativity and that, and that sort of thing. Briefly, all of that. Um, and uh, what I would say is perhaps an early run on the board quick win, I think is actually just really communicating what is out there. It's very, very difficult if you're a startup, you know, because we all we all have our own networks and connections to figure out where do we go, where do I go, how do I get the help. Um, I've, I've just written down the ones that I meet with, Can Do Scotland, Entrepreneurial Spark, Entrepreneurial Scotland, Social Investment Scotland. It's just about to stand up a £50 million fund, Scottish Edge. All of it is fantastic. As you say, Chris, compared with when I came out of school, it's transformational what's there. But we just need to get it out there in a simple format so our youngsters, whether they're in school, coming out of school, or, or, or second careerists, uh, just know what support and help is there. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll turn now to Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Just a couple of brief questions. Graham mentioned at the outset the Scottish National Investment Bank uh, proposals. We've heard from um, people in this inquiry that, that um, getting hold of debt finance is not so much a problem, but getting hold of patient capital and equity uh, is. So I just wonder if anyone's got any particular views on what they might be looking for for the Scottish National Investment Bank to grow and support the sectors you're working in. And secondly, from um, other small countries like Denmark or other sub-state regions like the lender in Germany, what ideas um, have you got as to how we can um, support growth in the sectors you're working? What do other countries do well that we could learn from? Uh, Graham, I'll, I'll start start very briefly. Um, I, I think you're absolutely spot on with what you said, Andy, in terms of patient capital. I think with uh, SNIB, I think the potential we've identified, and I've been working, we submitted a consultation paper to them early on uh, last, or should I say late last year, 
Um, back to fintech, there's a point, and I'll bring in probably Chris and Louise on, on the back of this, if I may, but there's a point comes when you're starting up a fintech, and the ones that are successful, where you just need an investor that's going to stay with you for a period of time, maybe two years or something like that, so that you can refine your product, you can get your product organised, you can get it to market. And that is where you do need some patient capital before traditional forms of finance will then kick in and pick you up. So I think from a, uh, from a banking financial services standpoint, um, that would be the, the sector of the market in particular. We would see um, SNB being very helpful. But as I say, I'll maybe defer to Chris. And um, Peter Moforth would like to come in. Yes, One um, practical step that could be taken f uh, is to do e-commerce feasibility testing for anybody who wants to, to do it. Um, you don't have to guess about whether an e-commerce business is going to be successful or not. There's a huge amount using analytical approaches, looking at search volumes, um, market trends and the, the, all of the parameters that define whether whether a company is going to be successful in e-commerce is open to measurement using big data, AI techniques, machine learning and so on. And that's something that, that if that were offered as a service through something like an investment bank, that could produce a really valuable thing to reduce the risk, to know that you're going to be backing winners. It's a very simple thing and, and that could be done here and now. Um, Chris van der Kyle. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, to pick up on Scottish National Investment Bank, one comment I would I would first make is that, and I know this has been a source of much confusion to many people, uh, but the current Scottish Investment Bank, SIB, which is within Scottish Enterprise, has been hugely successful in partnering with patient capital in Scotland. It's a great model, which we shouldn't lose, and I, I know that's not the intention, uh, but the team there... I have partnered, for example, with, with many of the pri Scottish private investors and TV Squared, uh, which I believe will, will be a fabulous out outcome for everyone. And the model is quite simply, someone else leads, patient capital comes in, an SIB and a long-term trusted partner who then give a lot of stability into the investment. So that's been a great model and we should continue it. To me, the Scottish National Investment Bank model, that's, uh, you know, the, the, the consultation has just come out. Um, if it focuses and if it makes big material plays into sectoral change, it will be successful. If it ends up, and I hate to say this in this room, but slightly trying to keep everybody in the parliament happy and every, um, you know, every personal agenda and, and, and local challenge, I, it will not be successful. It needs to focus on certain things, and I'm not going to say, I mean, it'd be obvious for the things I would think it should focus on, um, but there'll be a number of strategies. And, and within the consultation paper, it talks about that, but then you, one can interpret it as, wow, that could go so wide and broad, it'll have no impact. So to me, in terms of this idea of patient capital, there's a huge opportunity here, and I think it's a brilliant idea, but it will only deliver if those behind and those responsible for directing Scottish National Investment Bank make some pretty tough choices and go for whatever the core growth sectors are rather than trying to plug gaps that everybody, you know, uh, everybody jumps on a hobby horse in place. And, um, Any um, ideas on what we can learn from other countries? I can give you, sorry to, be, to dominate the conversation, <coughs> dominate the conversation, but I can give you one that I remember as clear as day, was in the late 1990s, Scotland received a learning visit uh, from uh, the Israeli equivalent of, of Scottish Enterprise. And I remember listening to the, the chief executive talk about their strategy. And at that point, Scottish Enterprise had a slightly larger budget than it does today. Um, and at that point of a country which is a population very, very similar scale to, to Scotland, they spent exactly the same budget as Scottish Enterprise did, but only in high growth, principally technology-based businesses and support for those, whereas Scottish Enterprise, and I think under Robert Crawford at that point, um, had to balance between infrastructure, training, you know, at th this point I just made in, the p to, in answer the p to the previous question, I diversified out of existence. And if it had focused in the way that the Israelis had done, we may well have the second largest source of NASDAQ-listed companies um, in the world behind North America, as they do. 
Mm. And Louis Smith wanted to come in on this. I'm, I was just going to reinforce Chris's point. It is absolutely critical if you look at any of even the European players, Israel, I was actually going to use Israel, even India now in terms of where its focus is and Asia PAC, we are seeing targeted areas of focus in growth strategies, not going for everything. And that means tough decision making. And then once those decisions are made, is how we then stick to them. So I don't think that's any more complex than picking those areas and then a strong and clearly delivered strategy to continue to push for them. And you can pick all of those areas and you can actually start to, you can actually start to see those ones or twos that emerge as areas that they are uh, focused on. Israel's fairly obvious. India, again, we're seeing huge amounts of disruption and growth in wallet, but also credit risk decisioning. So it's how do we continue to stick behind those decisions? And Emil Strickland. Mine is more of a kind of cultural learning as opposed to a, an actual strategy. If you look at the kind of Californian model, um, there is much more encouragement for the kind of creative destruction. So you're funded, and then if you're if you if you don't if you're not successful, you die. But you have an opportunity to try again, and then you can die and you try again. And this kind of Champeterian model uh, has proved to be very successful. I don't think that. Uh, is mirrored in Scotland. It's a kind of one shot, and if you fail, not true in all cases, but it's a sort of more of a one shot. And if you fail, you you're kind of not uh, able to raise finance in, in the same way again. <laughs> Do you want to say that to get it on the record? <laughs> of course. Yes. Uh, just my comment is, and this from the country that brought you, Robert the Bruce. Very good. Well, I think that's probably um, our time up, so we'll, we'll finish on that, that comment. Thank you very much to all of our guests for coming in today. I'll suspend the meeting so we can change over to our next panel of witnesses.
Well, good morning again and welcome to our second session with uh, uh, another witnesses roundtable this morning. Um, I think most of our witnesses were in during the last session, so have seen how, how things operate. No need to uh, press the buttons on the desk in front of you. The sound desk will operate the mic system. If you want to come in, simply indicate by raising your hand, and I'll try and bring you in as and when we can. Um, we'll try and keep committee members' questions brief to allow our witnesses to uh, speak a bit more. So I'll just start with our guest, perhaps if you would just um, uh, give us your name, organization, and a very brief introduction to what you do. We'll start with Stephen Good and move around the table from there. Thank you. Uh, afternoon. My name is Stephen Good. I am Chief Exec of the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. Uh, we were one of Scotland's eight innovation centres helping drive um, growth and, uh, and economic impact, uh, social impact across uh, the construction industry in Scotland. Mark Baxter, Managing Director of Gallifer Tri Investments and now recently Facilities Management Business. Uh, we do a lot of infrastructure work across Scotland and the UK. Uh, good morning, I'm Alistair Whaley. I'm Chairman and Chief Executive of a company called CCG uh, in construction in Scotland, uh, predominantly in Scotland, and uh, I'm glad to be here and help to contribute. I'm Don McCaskill. I'm the Chief Executive of Scottish Care. That's the representative body of social care providers in the independent sector. That is non-statutory providers, charitable and for profit, and working mainly in older people's care and support. Hello, I'm Annie Gunnar Logan. I'm the director of CCPS, which is the, care, uh, the Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland. Very similar job to Donald's organisation, um, with the difference that our membership is only non profit, voluntary, or third sector providers, um, and our range of activity goes right across the spectrum of social care so, children and families, community care, adults, older people, homelessness, criminal justice you name it. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'll open with a, a fairly general question which um, you may wish to adapt or consider in the context of your own particular sector. And this is, um, if you can give comment on the Scottish economy, how it's performed over the last 10 years, how you see it moving forward um, generally and also in relation to your particular sector. Um, who would like to start off with that? Uh, Annie Gunnar Logan. You, I'll start. Um, over the last 20 years, um, the voluntary sector's kind of market share of social care, if you like, has, has, has grown exponentially. I mean, it's kind of unrecognisable from, what, from where it was. Um, in the last 10 years, not so much, I would say. Um, our membership has a combined annual income in Scotland of about 1.1 billion. Uh, round about three quarters of that is from the public purse. Um, and the rest is from charitable, uh, other, other charitable income, fundraising, legacies, big lottery, grant-making trusts, and so on. Um, and that hasn't, that hasn't changed enormously in the last 10 years. Um, growth has been quite modest in the last 10 years, and I think that's the combined effect of uh, public service expenditure restraint linked with austerity, um, and it's also an effect of public procurement reform um, in Scotland in particular, which has focused very much on kind of driving down unit costs and getting better value for money. So um, our membership um, and the voluntary sector more generally, I think, has pulled off the kind of feat often talked about but seldom seen, which is doing more for less. Um, that's where we've kind of got to now, really. And I think where, where we're at at the moment is a bit of a crossroads because what... Uh, what lies before us, I think, is kind of increasing public service and public expenditure restraint. Um, that's the story, that's the narrative that we hear. Um, I think that uh, the particular circumstances for the voluntary sector in social care are a bit different from some of your other witnesses because what we are dealing with is what we would call a monopsony purchaser market. There, there is one purchaser and that is the public sector usually through local authorities, health and social care partnerships. In the voluntary sector, there's not a great deal of what I would call private funders. I think it's sli slightly different for, for Donald's world. Um, but we're at a bit of a crossroads now because care, social care is all about people. Um, in our sector, up to 85% of the cost of any non-residential service is going to be workforce costs, direct or indirect. 
Um, and we are drive we've driven down the unit cost of care now to the point at which the Scottish Government had to come kind of riding to the rescue a couple of years ago with a commitment to pay the living wage in care because we were descending very much to a kind of minimum wage industry. And I know that's of interest to this committee because you also have fair work in your title. So um, I'd, I'd kind of stop there because I know we'll get into the discussion, but I was just kind of setting out a broad picture for you. Thank you. And Dr McCaskill. I would agree completely with everything that Annie's just said. I, I think, and one of the reasons actually, I think both Annie and I welcomed the opportunity to come to this committee. Too often social care is seen as a detriment, as a drain, and the language we use around social care is not around innovation and entrepreneurship. But the reality is, particularly in small organisations, there is an astonishing degree of creativity and innovation happening up and down the country. We recognise that the contribution of social care to the wider Scottish economy is something in the region of several billion pounds, and our paper and submission highlights research that's ongoing on that matter at the moment. But all too often, that is not the narrative that we hear. So we talk about how can we reduce costs, how can we limit the amount of resource which the state spends on social care, which predominantly is public financed. But we contribute a huge degree. One in 13 Scots works in social care. Mm -hmm. We have a, a contribution through enabling individuals to go out to work because a family member is being supported. And we also have systems in Scotland which enable individuals to live independently and maximise their own potential. So we'd like to see in the next 10 years a re-emphasising of what we mean by Scotland's economy. It isn't just the fiscal, the technological economy. It is that social economy which enables Scotland to be a different place to live and to work in. And from that perspective, whilst there may be a retraction in terms of the amount of fiscal expenditure, there is opportunity to expand our social care economy. Mark Baxter. Firstly, I apologise. This will probably come across pretty negatively, but uh, you'll be reading some of the press about the industry I'm in at the moment. Uh, industry is not in a very good place, and I'd, I'd sort of like to adapt the question slightly in terms of where we find ourselves at the moment. Um, UK-wide construction uh, infrastructure industry did about 80 billion of turnover last year and lost collectively a billion. That's not sustainable. The last three Scottish, large Scottish infrastructure contracts have been an unmitigated disaster for the contractors involved. Um, and we need to move forward from that. Um, there's a number of threats looming for our industry going forward, Brexit being the biggest one. It's one thing we can probably be sure of is there'll be labour migration away from our industry. Uh, I think that's a big threat for Scotland in that what will happen is the contractors will use the resource they've got and pull in. So the extremities, and, and we, we work in some pretty rural locations and just built a fairly sizable school in Shetland, the extremities will suffer. So I'm seeing a number of threats here and I think there's a job on for Scotland to market itself as a place to do business and a place to do these works because I, th I see the threats to us as an economy more than the opportunities at the moment. Big <coughs> international contractors will not come if we are not attractive enough. So that's the reality I'm living at the moment. I'm just wondering what the unmitigated disasters was that you referred to. What, what do you mean by that? Just so, so financially, commercially, the M8, the Aberdeen bypass and the, the bridge have not been a success for the contractors involved. And you can see that Carillion have gone to the wall, not solely on the back of, uh, of that project, and Lagan are also um, struggling. So, so the contract styles and types we're signing move too much risk to one side where the risks are not possibly understood or known. And we need to move towards a more partnering contractual basis. So um, NEC type three contracts, um, target cost, cost reimbursable, this idea of fixed price lump sum with uncertainties on large infra projects have not worked for the last three. I mean, I think from public sector, we've got a, we've got a bargain there, so that's great, uh, but that's not sustainable. I'm just wondering with the Brexit you mentioned, but also in terms of procurement, that will um, 
make it possible to uh, approach such projects differently in the future? I think that there are already options open for us, um, and, and what we've tended to do in the past is look at 70% uh, price, 30% quality. Uh, we can, under the regimes we've got at the moment, still look at look to 100% quality, 0% price at the extreme, or other forms of contract. So there are options open to us at the moment. There might be more options open up under the Brexit piece, but that, that remains to be seen. Right. Um, Alistair Wiley and Stephen Good. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Gordon, our convener. Um, you know, we've got a slightly different take on Mark. Uh, we're an indigenous uh, Scottish business, um, and some of the frameworks that we have been successful in gaining entry to has given us a direct route. There's still some improvement in terms of the manner in which these frameworks move on. Um, however, the, the aspect of open tendering in our very small market uh, we're a business of 130 million, so we're, we're not grandiose in the, in the billion uh, pound area. But we find that uh, being in Scotland, uh, having engagement directly with frameworks has assisted us. Um, I know we're going to go on and talk about skills and training, uh, and I can give uh, very, very good um, statistics about what we've done as an indigenous business. So we're not, we're, we know that there's... there's uh, there's uh, surpri not surprises, but there's some aspects about Brexit and what have you. But we believe in terms of social housing, the investment with the Scottish Government in that area, it certainly helped us as a business to sustain and, in fact, grow. I mean, we've now got 700 employees on our books, uh, and that has all been a result of performance. Uh, sure, we know that there's been some uh, difficulties in some of the bigger projects uh, that Mark has just described. But the environment that we're in is less troublesome and there's a, a, a more uh, compassionate manner in which we do business, certainly in my experience, over the last uh, three or four years. Again, Stephen Good. Um, yeah, I mean, I would echo uh, Alistair's comments and perhaps not quite as <coughs> glass half empty as Mark's approached it. Um, Innovation Centre was born in 2014, um, so we have uh, have been here a relatively short period of time, but in that time, um, the engagement particularly with um, SMEs, micro-businesses within construction, which makes up the vast majority, over 95% of the businesses are, um, they have a huge appetite for innovation and for doing things differently and for change, uh, and they tap into, I think, a network now, um, including the Innovation Centre network in its widest sense, that, that didn't exist in 2007. Um, and if you go back, as Annie suggests, you go back, you know, 10 years before that, you know, there's a there's an interesting comparison in terms of how we've just listened to, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the digital side of things uh, and technology. Um, Google was formed in 1998, and the construction industry uh, wrote a report called Rethinking Construction by Egan in 1998. And if you look at the difference in terms of those two, you know, um, industries as they've developed over that last 20 years, uh, I think construction industry in Scotland um, best years are most definitely ahead of it and I think we're in a really interesting place now in terms of the opportunities that exist moving forward. All right. Um, Annie gunnar Logan wants to come back with a comment, then we'll move to questions um, from Gordon MacDonald. Annie. Yeah, th thanks, Convener. It's just to, um, something that Mark said uh, resonates with me um, and that's about the sustainability of public contracts in particular. Um, this, is a, this is a very significant issue in social care for our sector. Um, we do, um, every year we do what we call a business resilience survey. We used to call it the provider optimism survey and we had to stop calling it that. Um, it's now called the business resilience survey. It's very, kind of along the same lines as the CBI, just kind of tracking trends. Um, and in 2016 and 17, the, the proportion of our members that had walked away from a contract uh, and withdrawn was 20%. Um, last year that went up to 33%. So we've got a third of providers who are now saying, I can't do this anymore, We're, this is not sustainable. Um, and the same survey told us that 60% of our members had declined to tender when an opportunity arrived, just because the numbers don't add up. So there's, a, there's kind of a bit of a resonance for me there about the, the future sustainability of public contracts in particular. We're not talking about kind of private purchasing here. All right. Um, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, one of the issues we've discussed in previous weeks is uh, productivity. And, you know, we know that productivity has in, uh, improved in Scotland from 94% of the UK rate in 2004 to 99% in 2016. <coughs> However, we heard from the previous panel 
but the pace of change is increasing all the time. And I was just wondering how you see the technical, technological change in automation impacting on your own sectors. Um, Dr. McCaskill. One of the challenges for, so for social care is that technology comes with a cost, and that involves innovation, implementation, it involves design, and it involves training and equipping a workforce. Annie's already alluded to the reality that both for her members and our members in a sustainability survey just a couple of months ago, many of them are worried about actually can, being able to continue to deliver the service. Are we going to have enough workers to engage in social care at a very basic level? So the space for innovation is very cramped and very limited, not least if public contracts are ripping out between 12 and 15% of allocated costs for training and learning and development. So training people to do the job is basically what most providers, whether in the charitable, voluntary or private sector, are just about managing to do. Some, they're not managing to do it. However, many see technical innovation as a real potential. So technology which enables you to map an individual in their own home to see whether or not she or he is becoming more frail because of the way in which they use the kettle, the way in which they move, the frequency in which they put their lights on. We see real potential for that. And there are many instances in which technology-enabled care which has been developed in Scotland, has been exported elsewhere. The problem is that we need to use that in appropriate balance. Technology cannot be used as a cheap mechanism to remove human presence. And for me, ultimately, with a palliative care background, I think about the most crucial human relationship, which is towards the end of life. I would value and can see the place for technology in enabling my pain management. But at that point, as in so many points of social care, we are about human beings. We are about human touch and human presence. So technology can certainly enable presence, but it cannot replace it. Thank you. Alistair Wiley. Another point. Our business invested about uh, £10 million pounds about eight years ago in our a production line for off-site manufacture. Um, the construction industry in Scotland, there's about 80% of the, the houses built in Scotland are timber frame construction. We went beyond that. We invested in a technology that was imported from Germany, I must admit, um, uh, close panel construction. Uh, that has enhanced our ability to increase eff uh, efficiencies. It's also enabled us to be much more competitive and in fact, we are now considering, not considering, we will be putting in a second shift. So we currently employ about 50 in our off-site manufacturing base in Canvas Lang. I'm talking to our managing director tomorrow, a meeting. Uh, we have now got put together a proposal for shift working. So we're going to keep our 50 on our first shift. We're going to duplicate that by key operators being introduced on a short-term basis for the second shift and that second shift will be in place by September. So the technology that we've grasped has enabled us to perform better. Uh, I know that one of my colleagues is involved in the off-site solutions. Again, that's an amalgamation of timber kit contractors in, in Scotland, and that group is together as lobbying the parliament for more support. We went much beyond that. We have got the state-of-the-art production facility because we, had, we knew the off-site manufacturer back then was going to promote us and going to be the right place to be now and in the future. But we're never, what we've now got is research and development. We've now got to look at that and we, go, we know that people will catch up on us. So we need not to sit rest in our laurels. We need to look at the future and how we can develop what we have got. And so much so, the company that we bought this stuff for is a company called Vyman. And we have had their production guy in our factory two weeks ago who's looking at how we can improve our output with the, uh, the, the equipment we've got and additions that are currently on the market that we can interface with our current uh, production line. Uh, a few years ago, I was very fortunate to, to visit CCG's premises at Canvas Lang, and um, I was very impressed by what you guys were doing on site. And I think you built the Athletes' Village for the, the Commonwealth Games. Um, you know, traditionally, construction in recent years has had low growth and, and low 
exports. But um, the UK government um, announced uh, in the autumn there that they are going to prioritise the use of off-site manufacturing uh, and have um, highlighted the Department of Transport, Department of Health, Department of Education, Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Defence that there should be a presumption in favour of off-site construction by 2019 for capital programmes. How is Scottish construction currently... Are they set up in order, to, in order to exploit that opportunity to give us a bit of growth and to give us more employment opportunities? And how is the Innovation Centre, if we can hear from Alistair first now, Stephen, how could the Innovation Centre help with that? Forgive me, I'm maybe a wee bit uh, insular and parochial in my outlook. Um, what, what we want to do is we believe that there's a market in Scotland for us. Uh, that business that I'm referring to just now turned over uh, a modest 10 million. We see that being increased next year to 13.5 million. We see that being Scotland. What we need to do is we need to then embed the second shift. We need to ensure that the capacity and the efficiency of that capacity can service that market. We did have uh, some penetration down south about four years ago, and we took a bit of a nosebleed, which wasn't was good. However, I read all these statistics, Gordon, and I know that there's potential down there. But the way I work our business is the fact we make it right, the foundations are solid. Once we've got it right, once we improve efficiencies, once we've got a second shift in and everybody is reading from the same hymn sheet, then we can decide whether or not. But it's good to know that there is that investment down south and we see that being a market that is in our vision, but not currently. We want to make sure that we embed what we see being the good things in construction and then move forward from, from there. Yeah, I would add to that, I suppose, that um, there are companies like CCG that have invested significantly in the future technology, uh, training skills, um, using digital solutions to deliver um, construction uh, output. And um, they're not alone, but they are one of the leaders by, um, by some significant margin. And the job of things like Offsite Solutions Scotland that we, we facilitate on behalf of the 10 companies that um, are involved in it is really to give them that platform um, to go and explore the bigger opportunities that might exist. Um, Al Alistair's right, there's a huge amount to be said in the Athletes Village is a, a case in point where local companies delivered a hugely successful um, solution in terms of the, the, the housing uh, piece there. Um, that consortium, I suppose, was part of the forerunner in some respects to Offsite Solutions Scotland, where there's now 10 companies leading offsite manufacturers at different scales within their their um, their kind of development. Some that produce, you know, no more than 10, 15 houses a year, but using very highly offsite um, covered solutions, and some CCG, Stuart Mill and Robertson Group that produce thousands of houses uh, a year, homes across uh, across the UK. Um, where I think there's a huge opportunity is picking up on things like the Industrial Strategy uh, Challenge Fund and the, the sector deal from construction that has um, done two things, hopefully by smart design. One, which is to put you know, a significant amount of money on the table to pump prime uh, innovation within the construction industry. But the other thing is to satisfy, and it picks up on a point that Mark made around the procurement sort of piece, is that that in itself will not fundamentally change the construction industry. Um, and given that, I think in Scotland alone, 60% of the construction activity is public sector client-led, public sector clients therefore have a huge opportunity to drive um, innovation um, within the industry. A smart client is ultimately the best thing for the industry to respond to. Uh, and if you know departments within the UK government are feeling confident enough and the evidence appears to support what they're trying to do enough um, to put their weight behind um, a presumption in favour of off-site manufacturing and all the digital construction activity that, that supports that, um, then I think that's a good um, sign that the Scottish Government to satisfy the kind of point that Alistair made around what can we do with the indigenous Scottish companies here that are world leading, frankly, in terms of the timber engineering. Everybody thinks it's Germany and Scandinavia and Austria. It's here. Uh, it's companies like CCG and, and, and others that are doing it. Um, there's a huge opportunity um, to align those policy decisions, the procurement side of things, around um, how that stimulates for an industry that operates at particularly low margins often, how it can invest in innovation and R&D and skills. Um, sorry, just, just wanted to bring Mark back, so thinking on that point, then we'll come back to you, Gordon. And 
go to Kersey, yeah. Doug Dale. You've been touched on a couple of the points I was going to make. Uh, one of the challenges we've got as an industry is the margins we operate on. So turning around and saying I'll invest ten million in a technology that may or may not pay off, uh, that's a sort of billion pounds worth of turnover to, to make that investment just on, on, on the sort of margins we work at the bottom line. Uh, we have seen some advances, so BIM's a good one. An intelligent client promoting BIM, and so business model uh, building modeling, so we, we know exactly what we're building, makes buildability better and improves health and safety as well. Um, but if you walked around a site um, this year and walked, had, had walked around a similar site 20 years ago, short of hard hats on and glasses on, it's people on the end of shovels building these buildings. So we've not moved on as an industry, and it's a big frustration for me where is the big leap in our industry going to come from to make us sustainable? We Modular, if you're, if you're building the same thing again and again, there's definitely opportunity there. When you're building bespoke asset again and again, then, then, then that's more difficult. I think there's a um, government could press modular in areas like schools. We've tried to, with limited success, um, council see it as forcing a single product down their throat. I see it as being more efficient and, and being able to give public sector more asset for the same buck. So if we could press that sort of agenda for more uh, consistency, um, we'd, we'd see more sustainability, you'd see a better product, you'd see less defects. There's, there's a number of benefits from that. In terms of, you, you're saying that the industry hasn't moved on <laughs> in recent years. Um, in terms of procurement, is there anything that the client can change within um, procurement to encourage innovation, not just in the construction sector, but also in the care sector as well? Is there anything that can be changed within procurement? I can answer that. Mm -hmm. Direct appointment. Direct appointment. Just on the point that I don't, I don't want to go against what Mark's saying. We built the highest uh, CLT uh, construction in Scotland. Uh, we finished it, we've just finished it. It's handed over next Tuesday, seven storey high at Yoker. Um, we're not frightened to take the leap. It's a 10 million as well. If I thought I was not going to make money out of 10 million, I wouldn't have put it in. But I had a belief that we could do it on a similar basis. We had the idea, we were supported by Napier to do a project for CLT, the commercialisation of homegrown timber in Scotland. We had to back off because Legal and General Homes were going to invest 55 million. We bought a premises out at Eurocentral, 130,000 square feet. We've since let it to Lidl, but that was bought uh, in a desire to promote CLT on top of the close panel. So we're not lacking innovation, not a bit. You know, all you need to know is, the point I made earlier, Gordon, was we're not going to go down to England unless we know that is a fertile place to be. Once we're confirmed that that's going to be that case, I will we'll put the posse out and see what's, what's down there. And Annie Gunnar Logan wanted to go. Yes, no, I, I think there's huge potential for tech in our in our sector, um, but I think the the the, the concern that, that we have is that commissioning authorities will see tech as a replacement for people rather than as an enhancement of the service. Um, and I think if we could get that right, would 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 be able to uh, get on a bit further. I mean, you know, everything that Donald said about replacing the human contact of social care, that's what makes it effective. So just giving someone a button to push instead of um, in, instead of a support worker to talk to, you know, that, that would kind of take us further, further back rather than further forward. Um, in terms of streamlining organisational processes, I think the potential for tech is massive. What we have there, given what I said about the sustainability of public contracts, is that you've got organisations now that are returning very modest or no or, or operating surpluses so they don't have the kind of r d investment capacity themselves to do that so they're either borrowing or they're you know looking looking for grants to do that so the, the potential for the kind of efficiencies that you're talking about and, and productivity gains i think is there but it's it's where you actually get the investment and again going back to what donald said at the beginning, um, social care is so often seen as a cost rather than an investment. And part of the the, um, the great delight, if I may say so, of speaking to an economy committee about this is to try and turn that round. Because normally, Donald and I, you know, our home is to the health and sport committee here and uh, local government committee to a, to a lesser extent. But so it's kind of quite good to bust out of those confines because the, the, 
that is where we are seen as a, as a cost to the public purse rather than a contributor to the economy of Scotland. And I think that's where this kind of discussion is really, really helpful. Good. Um, Dr. McCaskill. Just very quickly, I think we've also got to recognise that technology is not neutral. So, unfortunately, in social care, a lot of technology has been used as a contract monitoring mechanism, which has had a, and is having a very detrimental effect. So, there's a particular piece of software, which I will not name, which is utilised to track whether a worker is where he or she should be, and if that worker either a isn't there for a particular period of time, that worker in the organisation is not paid. So there are real fair work issues around the use of technology in the social care workplace, which I think the, the committee should be aware of. In terms of the question around procurement, both Annie and, and, and organisation and our own have for long campaigned for us to change the way in which we buy and commission care. We need to embed what we have in Scotland, which is a very solid piece of statutory guidance on procurement, which is based around the person, human rights in orientation, and emphasising the voice of the individual in the purchase of care. We're not abiding by that in most of our contracting mechanisms, which tend to, and increasingly in austerity, are seeking the lowest cost, not necessarily the highest quality. All right, move on to questions from Kezia Dugdale. Yeah, thanks, Convener. If I can move us on to look at detail the issue around the provision of skills in your respective industries. So a two-part question, really. Um, first of all, how would you rate um, the quality of support that you get from enterprise agencies or, or skills agencies? Donald, you mentioned earlier that much of the cost of training is borne by your members rather than something that the, the state carries. Uh, and secondly, lo looking forward, how big a deal or how hard is the end of the free movement of labour to your respective sectors? Um, Alistair Wiley. Okay, so that, that, uh, we as a business have uh, uh, 32 trainee managers and we've got 71 apprentices. And the whole idea there was we did get support. We run through all the colleges that are available, Napier University and Caledonian University. So we're well supported there. If, if, if you have got a desire to create a DNA within your organisation, you know, a culture within your organisation, it should not necessarily stop at elements of finance. You know, we do not get covered for all the apprentices that we employ. But we need to replenish the industry. I was very fortunate as a young man to enter an industry that has, was sustainable. And I, I'm very aware of that. My duty now is to make sure that it's per, you know, perpetrated beyond that. So therefore, we don't look at it as, as what we get for support. We have all the colleges. And I asked my H&R people yesterday when I was coming, who, who are the, the good performers? And they couldn't rate them. They, they, they could not rate them. They couldn't just make any disparity between what the performance were and about 10 colleges that, that we work with and then the two universities, Caledonia and Napier. So from that point of view, we, we, we believe that whilst the financial support doesn't maybe square up, there's greater benefits to us as an organisation going forward. Our, our uh, flush through of, uh, you know, we, we, we went to the market years ago and tried to entice people of quality to our business. We found out pretty readily that we had to grow our own. And that is really what we've been doing now for the last, what, probably 10 years. Last year, we took on 25 apprentices. And fairly recently, trainee managers, we took on about seven. And that supports what we want to do as a business moving forward. In terms of, uh, and that's how we see the hierarchy. And we, what we've got to do as a business, we've got to make sure that we engage with that group to ensure that they see a flow moving forward, that there's no a dead end that it's not about what do I do beyond that. And fairly recently, we took on some very small projects through East Ayrshire Council uh, on, a, again, a framework. And my, my, my managing director approached me and said, look, there's some of them that are very small, you know, 20 units. And I said that is ideal to give stepping stones for our management trainees, and it's worked out that way. So from that point of view, we've got no criticism about support that we get. Um, Stephen Good. Yeah, I mean, we have the um, fortunate position, I suppose, of working across 13 universities and fairly soon almost every college in Scotland um, to support that pipeline, but actually going a little bit further, kind of upstream, I suppose, into schools, primary schools as well. Um, 
to sometimes dispel that myth that construction often is viewed a bit as an industry of last resort and not an industry of choice. Um, and that covers off all different aspects of, of um, how attractive the industry is uh, to women coming into work, how attractive that industry is um, to kids generally who, uh, coming back to the previous point about technology and digital, um, you know, what are the opportunities that the construction industry can offer in that skill sense? And I think it's that, it feels a little bit, to us, certainly, that construction is on a bit of a cusp of a digital revolution, and that's a good thing if we want to attract the talent in the future right across uh, Scotland to work within this industry, which we'll need to support you know, the um, investment that businesses are making in apprenticeships and, uh, and graduates and, and right across the whole piece in, term, in terms of growing talent as well within businesses. Because that part, I also touched on that part about culture and that, for an innovation centre that supports businesses around products and processes, innovation, that's obvious. But actually a big part is around that business innovation. It's the culture. How do you develop businesses that um, people want to go and work for because they're passionate about what that brand is trying to achieve and develop uh, and grow with that business? And that's hugely important. Um, there is, I think, the reality, uh, and again, as an innovation centre, it's not unusual for us to be probably a little bit further ahead in terms of the technology we are aware of, the opportunities that the industry um, has on its on its kind of horizon. Um, but the training that exists uh, is certainly more focused on the traditional skills at the moment, but there is a huge shift, there's a huge move, a huge awareness, and we're working with a lot of the colleges and universities around the area of um, augmented reality, virtual reality, off-site manufacturing, um, um, robotics, all those different areas where there's an opportunity for industry to capitalise on what that technology can do to support the growth in industry, not replace um, skills for replacing skills sake, but actually creating higher value jobs within industry, creating environments um, that are possibly more attractive. If your perception is construction industry is pushing a wheelbarrow around the muddy building site, that will turn a lot of people off from this industry. So if we can showcase this industry as being vibrant and dynamic and technical uh, and, uh, and digital from that point of view, um, then the skills, the kind of the talent coming through from primary school all the way through will recognise this industry as a huge industry with a vast array of opportunities, um, whether it's in the professional side, the operational side, um, and that can only be a good thing. And I think a lot of the colleges, universities, uh, and through working with programmes like DYW, there is a huge realisation that construction has that variety to offer. Um, it, it just takes a number of different things that are already in play to be perhaps joined up. Um, Dr McCaskill and then Mark Baxter. One, one of the, the phrases I keep hearing and really resent is the phrase, it's just caring, it's not very skillful. To care is an immensely skillful activity and if that stereotypical view might have been valid 30, 40 years ago, it's certainly not valid now. The average care worker is engaging in highly skilled professional activity. Take, for instance, palliative and end of life. The 56,000 people who will die in Scotland this year, the majority of them will be supported by a social care worker towards the end of their life. And yet we do not have a distinctive priority in commissioning contracts to enable those individuals to be properly skilled, just as an example. So we need to, in social care, challenge the presumption that we're not talking about a highly skilled professional walk of life. Secondly, I would love Scottish Enterprise to have a dedicated team that consider the contribution of Scottish care. Oh, it's not Scotland, that would be a different, of social care in Scotland. Because if social care is going to contribute, as we think it already does, then we need to see it as something worthy of investment, of growth and opportunity. And we don't have that. And lastly, the Brexit question. Scottish Care has already presented evidence to both this committee and to the Health and Sport Committee of our significant concerns about the potential impact of the inflexibility of inward migration and more worryingly the already drain of individuals leaving social care and particularly social care nursing in Scotland. We are potentially facing a very, very real challenge. On the one hand, we do not sufficiently reward individuals, even even with the Scottish living wage for a highly skilled job and on the other hand we're seeing people who do choose to work in the sector being uninvited because of what is happening elsewhere. Mark, thanks. Well, take on something that, that Stephen said and then melt it with a comment I made earlier which I think referred to your, your second part of your question. We have to work tremendously hard as an industry to 
uh, outwardly look attractive, I think, in, in, a, in a world where you can join the tech sector and, and do clever things on your PC, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to work tremendously hard. I don't think as an industry we're particularly tied up on that. We look at our own uh, requirements for that year and visit the colleges that are local to our different offices and the universities, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we could be more tied up on that. And I do see, um, as I said earlier, uh, with, with Brexit coming, that's going to become more of a challenge. And I think that's acute for Scotland, uh, given where we sit in the whole piece. Right. Um, Annie Gunner Long. Yeah, thank you. I um, just wanted to echo what Don said. I, mean, I do think we've got a bit of a public image problem um, in, in social care because it's 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 seen as a very kind of low low skills, low grade area of activity, and and, and, and nothing <coughs> nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the, the the skills that are required by the workforce in uh, in our membership is is really about supporting and challenging people to control their own lives and make their own decisions. It's not just kind of coming in and doing things that other that, that people can't do for themselves. Though that's that, it's it's kind of changed out of all recognition really as as a skill set. Um, what I wanted to to raise um, in the context of this question isn't so much about the skills at the front line, but it's leadership skills which I think is a huge issue in our sector now because as I said earlier on you know what we're not looking here at um, you know a kind of boom time where the the skills are around kind of seeing opportunities for growth and going for it it's the, the skill the leadership skills we need are about change and transformation um, and certainly in the voluntary sector I think we're often kind of um, there's a bit of a cultural attitude to the voluntary sector sometimes that you know the, 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 the real skills are somewhere else not not in our sector but when you kind of consider um, the journey that some of our organisations have been on and the real reserve that's there of leadership skills, then I think actually the public and the private sector have got quite a lot to learn from us. Um, on, on this question, I just really wanted to kind of um, make sure I put this on, onto the agenda, and that's the, the impact of the apprenticeship levy in our sector. Um, you'll know that this is a, a 3% jobs tax, in effect, um, on any organisation that has a payroll over over three million, and, and um, unlike our colleagues south of the border, there there, there is no direct line of sight between you know, the money that you put in to the apprenticeship levy and how you're then able to extract that in terms of skills development and modern uh, and apprenticeships and so on. And I really do think that's that's an issue. We're, we're going to go and see Jamie Hepburn about that quite soon because that's that's a very significant problem. Um, it, it just is another cost to an organisation um, that, as Kezia said, you know, is all, the training budgets in our sector are already under very significant pressure, and this is yet another cost on top of that. Um, Brexit, it's uh, obviously a workforce issue, kind, kind of less so in adult care and support in some ways, I think. we Our, our membership is kind of looking at you know, up to 4% of its of its workforce being um, EU nationals who in, whose status is now questionable, I think. In Donald's sector, it's much, much bigger than that. It's the NHS is, the, is the, where the real Brexit issues are, I think. Um, Kizzy, well, I guess the follow-on from that is if you have a reduced working size population, then the pressures on your sector are going to increase indirectly uh, anyway. But I guess my follow-up question is more specifically about who, and this is for um, the care professionals, apologies to my construction colleagues, but I think the points are, are well made in that sector. But who pays for um, the innovation and, and the change that you are, are seeking to drive in your respective industries? Uh, I remember, you know, um, three or four years ago, um, change funds were de rigueur. Um, if you were a, a private sector entity, um, you could go to Scottish Enterprise um, to try something new, or there would be some sort of angel funding to experiment with a new way of doing things. How does that work in your respective sectors? Does it exist? Uh, is it something you um, pay for entirely yourselves? And are the pressures on that even greater because of the wider cost pressures you face? It's a bit of a mixed bag, really. I mean, it's, some of our members have had really good support from Business Gateway, from um, enterprise agencies, um, and, and some of them not. I mean, the, generally, the, the attitude seems to be that, you know, if, if you were setting up a plumbing company in Glasgow and you were going to employ 25 people locally, then you would find the local authority would be rolling out the red carpet for you, would be re re referring you to all kinds of support. If, you, if you're going to set up a care service and employ 25 people, we go back to, oh, you know, you're directed to social work and you are there for a cost. <laughs> 
Um, so it, it, it is a mixed bag. But the, I mean, the change funds were really, really interesting in social care because the voluntary sector took them and ran with them and did some really great innovative stuff. And then the change funds came to an end after three years and they all closed down again. You know, there, there was no real kind of sustained attempt to get those mainstreamed. Um, and by and large, I would say that most organisations, when it comes to you know, R&D innovation, they're, they're, they're having to fall back on their own resources, mostly. The return of the change funds would be welcome. Well, as long as they were... It would be welcome, but as long as they were handled differently, I think, and not seen as a kind of three-year thing to do something interesting, which may or may not then be taken forward, because that's, that's, we don't want that again, really. And just, just to add in... To, to add and agree with Annie. One of the differences between the independent sector is that we're significantly dominated by SMEs, so small organisations, who, yes, have the potential to be more entrepreneurial and come up with innovative solutions, but when there are real workforce pressures, nine out of ten struggling to find frontline workers, that capacity to be innovative and entrepreneurial gets pushed. So it would be welcome for a particular focus on innovation and social care, which was adequately resourced and funded and which was supported. Because listening to the earlier contributions, there needs to be an ability, which we don't have in social care, that if you introduce an innovation and it doesn't work, then that has a very immediate effect on individuals and on their care and support. So we are, a, in many senses, have to approach risk around innovation in a very different way. So my earlier plea wasn't tongue-in-cheek. It would be really good if organisations like Skills Development Scotland, like Scottish Enterprise, like Business Gateway, began to focus on social care and didn't just see us as the cost or as something unworthy of uh, intervention. You know, one, one of the things that annoys my members is that we know that contracts are being handed back all the time. Annie's already referred to this. Whenever there is a failure because of a contract in social care, we don't get a ministerial task force set up, yeah. even if there are five times the number of workers impacted in our local community, particularly in rural communities. So we need to change the language, alter the dialogue, and see social care as worthy of intervention and enterprise as any other walk of life in Scotland. Right, very briefly from Kezia Dugdale, then on to questions from John Mason. Just to say, thank you, Donald, I think that, that's an excellent point, but my final question was actually for our construction colleagues, just to even up a little bit. Um, Mark, earlier, um, I think your words were uh, that the M8, uh, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route and the, and the new Fourth Crossing were all unmitigated disasters for the private sector. I guess um, it could be interpreted from that that they were a huge success for the public sector, and I just thought you might want to um, uh, offer something for the official record about <coughs> uh, the consequence of... Um, continued unmitigated disasters like this on the private sector's capacity to do these uh, major public infrastructure projects? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that... Uh, so, uh, public sector got more asset for its money than it paid for. Is that not a good deal? Sure. That's, a, that's a good deal. Yeah. But long term, that's not sustainable. Because uh, Carillion went bust. And if we all keep going bust, then we've got 43,000 people unemployed and the cost of Carillion on UK PLC, uh, I would imagine outweighs the benefit we got from these off-market prices. But is that the public sector's fault or is that a question I think, for I think, industries? I think, uh, no, I think there's, the, there's, there's dual fault there. Um, uh, private sector shouldn't have taken these contracts on at the prices they took them on. Uh, and, and my company, as you know, are involved in, in one of these projects. Um, the contract form is what I don't think is sustainable going forward, and we won't be doing these again. We're already on record as saying we will not do that contract form again. Large infrastructure on fixed price lump sum, we will not do going forward. The, the risks and the rewards don't tally up. Um, so, so private sector stupid, public sector done well on these contracts, but that is not sustainable as an industry going forward. And then, sorry. Sorry. I'm just conscious of time, so um, well, 
Oh, are right, you man. saying that when your companies looked at these contracts that were offered to them, you didn't do due diligence on it and identify whether you had a profit element of the contract before you signed up to it? I think Is that what you Absolutely not. Uh, I think people got it wrong. Uh, they got wrong the what they thought they were taking on and the risks they thought they were taking on. And trying to manage these risks across a time period is uh, is not sustainable going forward. I mean, I think I, I think you'll find uh, you'll find a number of of people saying the same thing about these contract types. There are contract types we can operate where there's dual benefit. So NEC type three, uh, target price, uh, gain share, pain share, all of which doesn't involve pushing all the risk across to one side and all the pain across to one side. Equally. Um, if you push all the risk and all the pain across to one side and the money across to one side and these risks and pains don't manifest, you've not got a very good deal. So equally in the next one, the people looking at the pricing <coughs> of the trams, for instance, may look at some of the things that have been going on and say, here are the prices you're going to get uh, public sector and, and you may not get a good deal there. I just don't think that's a very good balance. Super profits and super losses don't make a great deal of sense to me. Shouldn't we go into it and with 2020 hindsight, You've done a good job. Here's a fair profit. We are delighted with what we've got, and a profit, and again, in a pain share mechanism, would deliver that. Right. Well, I'd like to move on now to questions from John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, as a committee, we, we're looking at business growth, economy growth, uh, all of that side of things. That's maybe what we've concentrated on so far. But we're also looking at inclusive growth, and I think. Uh, as Gunnar Logan mentioned uh, that earlier on uh, as well. Um, I mean, traditionally, looking at the two main sectors we've got here, construction and the care side, if we want to grow the economy and help businesses and make traffic move faster, then we would spend our m extra money on roads and railways and bridges and these kind of things. Uh, however, on the other hand, that will mainly help men, will it not? Because the construction industry is full of men. And whereas if we have some extra money to spend uh, on trying to help women, that would more, make more sense in the care sector because I understand most of your employees are women. Uh, is, there, is that a dichotomy? Is that a choice we have to make as a public sector or is it not as simple as that? Um, I think, did Stephen Good, <laughs> do you want to come in? And start on that one. Well, well let Stephen Good start <coughs> and then come to Annie Gunnar Logan and Dr. <coughs> McCaskill perhaps. I think, um, Inclusive growth, I suppose, in a, in a construction context, uh, is delivered. We we have a industry that operates across, you know, the whole country. Um, it operates with a with a, you know opportunity to work at a whole variety of different levels um, within the industry. So it's not uh, exclusive in that sense. I would suggest. Uh, I think it does have a. Uh, I think it does as an industry have a culture problem. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think it's. Um, I think the industry is doing a lot of work at the moment um, to try and address a lot of those challenges uh, around uh, around diversity broadly, but gender diversity particularly. Um, we, I know that we at the Innovation Centre are supporting uh, at the moment. I think four key projects uh, with subsectors of the industry, industry leadership groups, and with individual organisations to try uh, and put in place mechanisms. I think that a lot of industries, a lot of businesses, sorry. Um, perhaps fall into that trap of, um, of we've kind of done it, we've always done it this way, so we'll continue to do it this way. Our audience is predominantly male if it's op operations um, functions on site. Um, and it hasn't evolved in, businesses haven't evolved enough to be able to provide flexibility, to be able to provide um, the the working arrangements that often suit uh, the wider um, the wider kind of diversity um, issues. So I think from that point of view, there is, there is a, a lot of things that the industry is prepared to do and from the evidence that, that, that we're involved in with certain uh, organisations is actually tackling now. Um, but that's not to not to suggest that it's anywhere near um, tackled a lot of these uh, a lot of these deep seated, you know, historic challenges. But in in the broader sense of inclusive uh, growth, I think you know, if, if we as an industry can create opportunities where society as a whole um, benefits, and I think that's one of the opportunities the construction industry has uh, in plentiful supply because it does operate as an underpinning industry for most other sectors. Most other opportunities require some element of construction, whether it's building hospitals or uh, care. I mean, do you think the, the, the move in innovation, like, say, constructing things more inside rather than outside, it, it, is that looking like it might attract more women into the industry, or might it? Uh, 
from my perspective as a man, I think it probably might. It might be better asking one of the women, but I do know... <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, my point would be, I suppose that... Uh, well, I'll give you an example. So Ray O'Rourke, who runs Lang O'Rourke uh, organisation, uh, launched our innovation centre. Uh, and he took a slightly different tact on that, I suppose, is that with the move towards pre-manufacture, assembly, off-site manufacturing, working in um, you know, factory environments uh, to produce building components that are then assembled on site, that gives great opportunities for anybody to work, you know, not necessarily in a high-vis vest and a hard hat, but to work in a lab um, coat sort of approach. You know, it, it's, it's delivering technical solutions uh, often, and that creates opportunities right across, um, you know, opportunities for uh, women and men working within the construction industry. But we work with a lot of um, women within operational roles, leadership roles that work in exactly the same environment that all the men work in on construction sites, um, up scaffolding and horizontal wind and rain, and yeah, Kezia's point's exactly right, they're, they're equally waterproof. So, um, so yeah, I don't think, okay. I, I think there's a, <laughs> I think there is a, I think perhaps it's the perception uh, that yeah. construction as a male industry, it's, you know, it's perhaps not as flexible, it's not as accommodating often um, when, Women are perceived often as being the, the ones that um, take on a lot of other functions. And you know, from my own personal perspective, you know, our organisation is a small team of 14, but we are 65% um, female in a variety of different leadership and operational roles within our organisation. Okay, uh, thank you. I think that's true. Well, <laughs> we'll, uh, maybe we'll come to Annie others. Gunner Logan and Dr. McCaskill, perhaps. Well, yes, Karen support has got a very large majority of, of women working, and I mean, particularly at the front line. I think. Um, so, the, the, but the question of inclusive growth for me isn't isn't just about your capacity as an employer. It's the service that you're providing and how that enables inclusive growth in a wider sense. Because actually, by by providing care and support to individuals, you are you are actually freeing up family members to enter the labour market, which they otherwise wouldn't do. So, um, interestingly, the kind of childcare expansion was sold very much on that premise. You know, by expanding childcare. Uh, on the state, then that enables women to go back into work. We don't seem to apply that same kind of thinking to other areas of care and support. Whereas actually, you know, if if um, say the voluntary sector evaporated tomorrow, then you would get an awful lot of women opting back out of the labour market because they'd have to be looking after their own family members. Um, so I, I've never kind of quite understood why it's a different narrative for for the expansion of childcare than it might be for the expansion of. Um, older people's care, for example. Um, and a number of the services that our members provide are actually about trying to get um, people with challenges in their lives back into the workforce. I mean, you know, the, 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 these are not, the people who are supported by our members are not an inert group. You know, they, they have addiction problems, um, they have learning disabilities, they have mental health issues which fluctuate, and actually part of the care and support task is to support them back into work. Um, so it's the inclusive growth is actually the nature of the service that we're providing, not just about us as employers. Um, I mean, suggested that if it was a better paid sector, that in itself would attract more men in. Is that a stereotype or is that not fair? Well, it would attract more people in full stop. I mean, the, recru the recruitment problems that we've got at the moment are, are acute. And I'll tell you a story which I heard last week, actually, from um, the director of one of our successful mental health support organisations. Um, she was, uh, she secured her first post as a support worker in 1992 and her salary at that time was £14,000. It's 26 years ago, I think, if I'm doing my sums right. Um, she's now a director and she's seen the care industry, if you want to call, that, call it that, develop. Uh, so 26 years later, the support workers doing the same job that she was doing in the same kind of organisation are now earning £17,000. So that's what's happened in social care. Um, you know, the, the, the tiny, tiny increase um, over 26 years from 14000 to 17000 for a frontline support worker will tell its own story about inclusivity, I think, um, and will also tell its story about why we're having the kinds of recruitment problems that we're having. I mean, that particular individual was able to buy a fixed price flat in Dalmeny Street around the corner without going to the bank of mum and dad because actually in 1992, 14,000 quid was a really good salary. It's a really good salary. And that was the kind of value that we placed on employees in our, in our sector at that time. Not so much now, I would say. Okay. 
What Annie has said, I think we, we have to reinterpret what we mean by inclusive growth and what we mean by an inclusive economy. It's not just a tick box exercise. We have to challenge. I have appeared before this committee talking about gender segregation within the care sector. So it's by no accident that we have 86% of the workforce women who are underpaid and frequently societally undervalued. If one in 13 Scots, if that was a workforce dominated by men, I bet you we wouldn't be thinking that we were doing people a favour by paying them the Scottish living wage. So it's about the stereotypical gender segregated negative attitudes that we have to care as a contributor to society. Everything that Annie said, inclusion is about enabling people to be full citizens, to contribute if they have disabilities, if they have mental health challenges, or in my context, if they happen to have a number against their age which is over 65. So we have to, if we're thinking about an inclusive Scotland in the years to come, think about what are we doing to enable older workers as well. Many of those in social care are over 45 and female. They will be working for 20, 30, maybe even 40 years contributing to the economy and the well-being of society. But do they get that recognition? Not now. I hope so in the future. If, if we put more money into care and less into building bridges and roads, eh, the argument would be, I'm not saying this is my argument, the argument would be that the economy as a whole would suffer. How, how would you counter, counter that? I think we have a growing body of, of evidence, both in this country and elsewhere, that the contributive element, the, the gross benefit and value provided by social care far outweighs the pounds that you spend. So Annie's already referenced that if you, if you support somebody to enable them to return to work, or if you support an individual to enable them to have knowledge that their child or their mum and dad is being cared for, then they are able to contribute to the wider economy. Social care has tremendous potential to be an asset to Scotland, to reduce our indebtedness, but we have to change the language and we have to change our mindset and see social care as something which will contribute rather than which will drain. There's a draft report which is coming out, um, I think, next month that this committee will be very interested in. I'm not able to kind of bring it to you because it's not my report. It's been a piece of work that's been led by the Scottish Social Services Council. And it's very specifically aiming to quantify the economic contribution of social care in Scotland in terms of income, expenditure, employment, etc. And um, I've, I've seen a draft of it, and I, and I think the numbers will surprise you in terms of what you're talking about, you know, with the relative value of contributions. But I'm sorry, I can't kind of give that to you because it's not published yet. We'll, we'll wait but, for um, it. It might be useful if you were to forward that on to us when it, when it yes, does we'll come do. out. Yes, we'll do. I'll have a word with the clerks about that. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on now to questions from Colin Beattie. Thank you. Um, in a previous evidence session, Jim McCall highlighted that banks had a, a very important role in providing support to Scotland's SMEs, mainly, you know, obviously financial and advice as well. That, of course, was before the financial crisis. Post-financial crisis, how would you say, how supportive would you say the banking sector is nowadays? Um, Alistair Wiley. <coughs> Um, uh, Colin, uh, you know, from our point of view, and I heard it previously, and I, I did, uh, I, I know Jim McCall, um, the, the banks are not supportive. Uh, you know, we, we're a, a relatively medium-sized business. We, we internally finance. It's off our, you know, we, we, we cash support our businesses. So, but certainly from, from anecdotal evidence I'm aware of, that, 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 that getting money out of the banks uh, is, is extremely difficult and uh, the extent of security that they require, particularly in small organisations where you maybe don't have the asset to throw up to the bank. So from that point of view, if anything that can be stimulated by the Scottish Government to make that move, we heard about the Scottish Investment Bank and various things, 
unfortunately, I'm not fully updated with that type of thing because, as I said, we internally finance our projects moving forward. But certainly for the growth of Scotland, I would I would be one that would support that no end about some way that liquidity could be eased for some of the smaller start-up businesses to progress. Mark Baxter. Uh, less of a challenge for us as a, a PLC, but I think what we're going to see is a real challenge for the SMEs from the banks out the back of some of the the, the, the issues we've talked about in the construction sector, specifically some of these SMEs getting um, letters of credit and bonding requirements. And I think there is um, something that you as government can do there when you're putting projects out. Don't immediately say, I need a bond for this project or I need a letter of credit or I need this level of support because the SMEs will struggle to get some of that, I believe, going forward. Is there any direct evidence of that? See, we're seeing anecdotal evidence at the moment, in the, particularly in the insurances sector, that the, the, they've all, the banks and the insurances sector and the bond providers have all taken a bit of a step back to see what the outfall of, in particular, Carillion, is in terms of the knock-on effects on the SMEs. Less effect up here, I think, than, than down in England, because Carillion did less up here. But we're certainly seeing the, the big insurers taking a bit of a breath with reference to the sector in general. And I think that will have a trickle down. Uh, Dr McCaskill, did you... Just very quickly, in terms of social care, uh, social care could not be delivered in Scotland, certainly in the independent sector, if it wasn't for constructive and positive relationships with the banking sector. Uh, now, they, they have maintained and they have developed over the period of austerity. But we have also to recognise that it is extremely challenging and difficult for a small... SME, particularly in home care, to raise sufficient revenue in order to set up and to develop because of the insufficiency of continuous funding, the lack of contracts which offer sustainability and a mechanism which makes a contract compliance almost impossible to adhere to. So we could do a lot more in terms of the way in which we commission and contract social care to enable what is generally an open and positive desire to invest in social care from the banks, particularly those based in Scotland. We could do a lot more than we currently do. Thank you. And um, Stephen Good. I would maybe add, um, we have done some work fairly recently with uh, the, the team that supports SMEs across Scotland with, with Bank of Scotland, uh, and they are actively um, keen to explore what other assets exist within Scotland that they can highlight to the businesses that they engage with that are looking for support and finance, potentially. Uh, I mean, I agree with previous points that, that uh, you know, it's a different world now um, from pre-2007, absolutely. Um, but the support doesn't always have to come in the in the form of um, of a bank financing necessarily. The support could come through expertise, through a lot of guidance, support, access, as our innovation centre has been involved in delivering and, and launching last September. A facility where industry can come and and take the risks in a safe environment. In some respects, it can fail often, you know, regularly sometimes to make sure that it's refining and optimising and, and developing things. And that sometimes is hugely valuable, that the investment that um, the that, uh, public sector has put into, you know, nearly two and a half million pounds worth of equipment that industry can then come and use either through projects or a very, very low, you know, um, pay-as-you-go sort of model, gives them access that previously was prohibitive. You mm. couldn't, you know, an SME couldn't go and invest in the sort of equipment that Alistair described previously at CCG have invested in without having that certainty that there's a supply chain there that's going to want it. Um, so industry now has some of those accesses to equipment. Um, the Scottish National Investment Bank, I think, has a huge opportunity to step into those areas where, and again, talking from a kind of innovation perspective, um, the decisions on funding may be slightly riskier or perceived as slightly riskier from the traditional banking sector. So I think that's where, uh, and the kind of forerunner to the uh, investment bank around the Building Scotland Fund that was uh, committed to within the budget um, pre-Christmas, I think is a, is a great example of where very focused around housing, very focused around um, infrastructure delivery and, and, uh, and buildings. That fund can get put to great use, I think, with those companies that are keen to invest, are keen to innovate, they're keen to um, develop their digital skills, but they can't get the finance to do it through traditional means. There's there's uh, there's real opportunity there if if tackled properly and and critically, with an element of flexibility and, and dynamism. I think to the model. I, I, I heard previous um, 
uh, evidence sessions where it's that flexibility and dynamism that's required across all the different support mechanisms, I think, that, that, uh, that often sometimes doesn't feel like it's there. Um, that's, cri that's critical, crucial. Right, Andy Whiteman. Um, yeah, just a few questions that, um, arising out of the discussion so far. Um, from the care sector's point of view, uh, Donald, you've, 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 you've answered this in part, I suppose, but uh, perhaps if you want to do it, um, add anything to this. How, how, how can the care sector be seen as an investment rather than a cost? When, what are the key arguments? Do you want to address that first? Then I've got a couple of others. I think we've we've touched on some of them. Yes. Uh, we need to alter the contracting and commissioning model to enable a degree of continuity, which enhances sustainability and the desire to invest both externally, but also the desire to innovate, to grow, to to change. We recognise that demand is only going to go in one way. Uh, Audit Scotland two years ago said that at the current rate we would need to increase expenditure on social care in Scotland between 18 and 24 per cent unless we alter the way in which we're doing things. We are doing so and we are innovating and we are reforming social care. However, that will not reduce at what we would estimate still the requirement to increase expenditure of roughly around 12 to 14 per cent, which is why before Christmas elsewhere, I called on for an investment over three years of £1 billion in social care. So that degree of continuity, that degree of affirmation in the sector would go a long way to addressing our primary challenge at the moment, which is workforce. It is still possible to be better remunerated in other sectors, whether those be retail or hospitality, than it is in the highly skilled and in the demanded and a regulated environment such as social care. So our key platforms are continu continuity, sustainable, workforce which can only be achieved by our reformation of the way in which we commission care. If we do those two things alone, and others, and Annie might want to add some more, then I think we will significantly address the fact that social care is still seen as a drain and not as a contributor. So it does involve those two key elements. Um, I mean, there's there's 200,000 people in Scotland employed in social care. You know, that's not, that's not a negligible number, and I think if you if you if you link that just the kind of raw numbers there to the fair work agenda, and and what those individuals would be able to contribute to the economy if they were earning less than the bare minimum, there's you know that's that that's one argument. But I would I would come back to what I said before about the nature of the service that we're actually offering here, um, th th supporting people, not just the people who are supported directly by our organizations and our support workers but supporting the people who would otherwise have to care for them if they if they if those services didn't exist who would have to leave the workforce i mean i'm sure you could get some very interesting evidence from carers organizations about the value placed on unpaid care never mind the, the value placed on paid care and how the and how those link up um, but i think i think the, the kind of biggest issue for me is you know w when was the last time that we were faced with such an increase in demand ahead of us and perceived this as a, a, a disaster you know I mean, there are the, 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 the way that care is going the, the numbers of people the demographics everything will tell you that actually the demand is going that way and the investment is going the other way so how that makes economic sense you tell me um, because i just can't i can't see it so, so moving on from what you've said, and this relates to both, both, both sectors, what, what role can social enterprise and particularly cooperatives play in this? I mean, I was uh, speaking to someone running a cooperative care organisation in London, very successful, um, a lot of engagement, completely different procurement model. Um, and in construction, for example, we have much higher levels of self-procurement um, across Europe. In Germany, for example, we have technologies like Passafus, which are driven by clients, customers, being in control of the process of procuring housing, which is very different from the speculative model uh, we have here. So are there ways we can do business that put the, the customer, if you like, or the client, whatever you want to call them, more at the centre <laughs> of the business and therefore drive up services, investment and innovation? Yes, and this parliament legislated for it in 2013. It was called the Social Care Self-Directed Support Act. 
Scotland brackets, etc. Um, and, and precisely what that was about was about putting the power in the hands of the individuals who uh, who rely on the care and support that they receive. Um, not necessarily in terms of direct payments where you kind of take take the money and you become the employer and you know pe people found that kind of quite challenging. So there are a number of different options that you can have, but the, the clues in the title it's self-directed support. Um, and, and for us, that would bust out of this really uncomfortable position we're in, in the social care market, which, it, which is that it's a monopsony. We only have one purchaser. We have the, pur the purchaser is the public sector. So if they find someone who can do it cheaper, um, then they will take the, that contract and the, all of those people and all of your staff and tupy them over somewhere else and then that's all gone. Um, and that's the public authority making the decision on behalf of the supported people about who will support them. The Self-Directed Support Act is about busting through that, giving some power, some choice and control to individuals. Um, and I think, um, I'm not sure if, if it's come across your radar, but the Audit Scotland um, produced a report recently on self-directed support, which was, was quite, um, what was the word we would use? Critical, um, I think, about the extent to which local authorities have grasped that and run with it. Because obviously, if you're giving power to someone else, it means you have to give it up. And I think that's been kind of quite challenging. Uh, but that, that, Andy, is precisely the agenda that we're on here. And I think our members would, would love it if they were actually s selling to individual customers and that those people were in control. Cu a couple of our organisations have pretty much converted their entire client base to individual service funds and direct payments. And they're finding that's more sustainable, it's more stable, certainly, but it gives them that relationship with the individual, um, which is absolutely critical to the to the support relationship so yes yes there's a way to do it we've already legislated for it and we just need to light a great big bonfire underneath it in my in my opinion so I want to come in. Our, our written evidence highlights the self-directed support act and the fact that its implementation has been a unmitigated failure particularly for older people the idea of <coughs> micro enterprise of creative small producers which are local are at the heart of that legislation and we've largely failed but there are some success stories so two of our members are, are worker cooperatives and led. Bolliskin just in outside Inverness is a great example of a local community uh, identifying a need around social care, being supported by a larger provider in order to innovate and do things differently. But it can only be achieved if, we've, if we properly implement the Self-Directed Support Act and it's not in the best interests of some statutory authorities in Scotland to loosen the realm, the, the, the power which gives people control rather than keeps control in the centre. Wherever that centre is, it's not in my home. Alistair Wiley wanted to come in on that. Uh, Gordon, and, and to answer Andy, to try and keep the, the end up of the construction side of things, um, you know, certainly there's been great innovation in respect of the environment in which people, householders, utilise the product that's produced. Uh, you talked about passive house, Andy, and, and there's aspects of you know the, the, the new value of properties nowadays, the environment of properties, the room space of properties. Certainly I believe that the, the home um, uh, feeling uh, is greater with householders that we have, and we're ostensibly social housing, but we know that our designers are playing particular attention to the long-term benefits that that housing can provide to the environment of the, the householder generally. And Mark Baxter, you want to come in? Just a brief point, it's on, it touches across construction sector, care sector and investability. We've been working on a project for some time now um, <coughs> between two budget holders and something this committee could look at would be how the budgets interact. So a wee bit detail on the project. One of the budget holders uh, are the NHS Trust and the other budget <coughs> holder are the local authority. Now we can all agree that having someone in a, um, forgive me if I get my nomenclature wrong, I'm old fashioned in that way, a care home is better than an acute bed. But because the two budgets sit in different places, uh, somebody sitting in a care home bed is taking up local authority money they might actually prefer them sitting in the acute bed. To us around this table, that doesn't make a great deal of sense. It's not the correct investment case. It's not the right care for the person. And in the construction sector, it means I'm not building a project. So this committee could look at the interaction between the different budget holders and what represents best value for money for us as an investable case. 
Because we, we've, we've been banging our heads against the wall because we cannot unlock these two pieces. And it makes an eminently sensible uh, piece where people come into the system at, at one end, low end care, and perhaps progress up the system to acute care, or can come in after an episode to acute care and progress down that same site and system. And everything's on one site. I say with all the right care levels and care packages in place. We think that's eminently investable. We think that's sensible. We can't unlock it. Okay. Uh, and just one sort of final question, particularly for, for, for you, Mark. I mean, you were talking about um, financing infrastructure and the, from your point of view, the unmitigated disaster that has been these three major contracts. And you, you've talked about a number of models that we could yeah. um, look at. Um, can I suggest, because I think you have a background in PPP, that one of the reasons why there might have been a backlash um, um, and, and perhaps contracts being awarded that unfairly perhaps benefit the private sector, the public sector rather, is because the public sector has gone off PPPs, uh, because that was very good for the private sector. I mean, I, I, have we been through kind of 30, 40 years of kind of swings and roundabouts on this? Um, I, think that, I think that's spot on, spot on Andy. I mean, the, the PPP sector were... Um, in the very early days, took on risks that they didn't understand and made a whole heap load of money. So, so it's the other side of your same coin. So the, 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 the famous example is the um, for Zachary prison away back in the well, say 90s, I'm guessing, where the private sector made a massive amount of money refinancing something that was essentially off the government balance sheet. So there's a great example of private sector win a whole heap of money. And now what's happened is we've slowly bolted the doors and recognised the risks and, 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 and. And we've now got to the point where the, the, the seesaw has gone so far the other way that the, the risks are stacked on the other side. And we understand them pretty well. It's a pretty mature market now. It's not a very politically acceptable term, but we've got other terms we can use. It's still a mechanism we can use to put asset on ground for the public sector with the right mix of risks and rewards. Could I just make a point, if you don't mind? Uh, we, I'll give you an example, Andy, about uh, collaborative working. Uh, I won't name the, the projects, but I'll give you a description of the projects. One side was an open tender project uh, of a value of about 13 million. Not, not major, but from our point of view, a big project. And the other side, uh, it was a collaborative involvement that we had up front with an organisation that wanted to trust us. It was a direct uh, appointment, and we engaged with that company. In the open tender project, it was overvalued. Uh, over an open tender, uh, the, the client could not afford it. On the other side, we got it within the, the budget restraints that they had and in the timeline that they had. And, and I'll, I'll quote you afterwards. I'll give you the name of the projects afterwards. Anyway, the, we went back to the open tender project. The, com uh, the client engaged with us because it was a similar... Uh, uh, a similar engagement than the, 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 the conciliatory or the negotiated project and our team worked in value engineering to get the open tender project on line with their budget requirements. However, that was six months later than what they had agreed to put that on site. So I go back to what I said much earlier. If there's direct appointment with the right people, you can work within the restraints as long as it's collaborative and we all have a win-win attitude. <coughs> Stephen, good one to come in at this yeah, point I, as well. I just want to add, um, Kezi made a point earlier, and it picks up exactly on, on Alistair's point, which hits the nail right on the head, that there's not many other industries that manage to disconnect design, manufacture, assembly, and then management of um, of buildings as, as well as construction seems to do. Uh, and that's driven very much by the procurement relationship at the beginning. Um, and that transfer of risk, you know, if, if you, I'm an architect of profession, so, uh, you know, when you work with a client to design a building um, and you put your best efforts into designing the best building that they want, um, by the time you engage with the team that are going to actually assemble that, you're so close to the point at which the risk is transferred to them. They have no real involvement or have had no real involvement you know, far enough up the stream to really add value and really look at, if you want to see a lot of what you know we're, we're ultimately talking about here around you know, what does the future look like in terms of this industry's um, productivity and efficiency? A lot of it links into how you take that process, change it completely, so that you've got earlier, you know, contractor engagement. You've got um, you've got a much more manufacturing approach, I think, to the to the solution that you end up with. Now, whether that's a, a hospital, a school, or a house, um, 
you can approach it in a completely different way if you've got the teams that know how to deliver it engaged in the conversation right at the beginning. Um, and going back to that point of, you know, what did 2007 look like? It looked like an environment where there was a huge amount of partnering going on and then the world fell off a cliff and clients wanted not best value but cheapest cost. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, that, that for me is, is the salient point of this, is there's a huge opportunity moving forward from this point with all the various different moves. You know, you've got a National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland that's coming um, that probably doesn't think construction as a manufacturing industry, but construction as a manufacturing industry, it will be as it moves forward and embraces digital technologies uh, and tackles things in a completely different way. And that will only be ultimately delivered to its best value if you tackle that issue of procurement and Alistair's point around, you know, different um, project approaches with the same client can have quite different outcomes depending on the early level of engagement you have with the teams that have got the expertise to deliver these solutions. Um, well, Annie Gunnar Logan and Mark Baxter, and I see our time's almost gone, so these are perhaps the, the final two contributions. Um, yeah, again, what, what, um, what Stephen was saying resonates with me very strongly in social care because for me, com like bog standard competitive tendering in care is bust. You know, it's bust the system, it's got us to where we are now. Um, it's in care, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to do it because it's so, so hard to identify quality as part of a paper exercise. You know, it's impossible, I would say. Um, and also because the end user is left out. I mean, it's the buyer-supplier relationship, which is about the public purchaser and the, and the voluntary sector um, supplier. And you know, where the hell is the end user in any of that? So for me, exactly what the colleague there is talking about, the co collaborative commissioning and partnering has to be the future. We can't have this, you know, here's, here's my pre-specified 80 page thing that I want now, you know, how cheaply can you lot deliver it and will you please fight each other to death for the privilege thereof? You know, that's, that's, that's a bust model, we can't do that anymore. And I think exactly what the colleague was saying in, about construction applies in care as well. So if we really want to grow this sector, that's the way to do it. Thank you, and Mark Max. Steve's point there, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, sensible terms and conditions and early contractor involvement um, in a partnering model. One of the models that we are using that is working very well, she says that the hub model is working very well because that involves the contractor early on and you get together with the client in detail and I think you can, you can avoid a tremendous amount of cost and get good value for money through models that involve the contractor early on. All right. Well, thank you very much to all of our guests. Um, that concludes this uh, section of the meeting, so I'll suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session. Thank you to all of our witnesses for coming in today. Thank you.